Welcome to this regular school committee meeting of Thursday, December 13th, 2018. Um, joining us today, we have our AEA representative, Jason Levy. Um, welcome. I guess we don't have our student representative today. Um, Dr. Seuss will not be here because of the family, family health issues, and Mr. Thielman will be late because of family issues also. Um, and with this, we're going to begin with uh, Mr. Gilbert, you want to come up? Mr. Gilbert is the outgoing MESC field director um, mm -hmm. who has been working with us all year for the past year and a half, two years, on updating our school policy manual. And with that, I'll bring it over to you. So um, I would say to you that uh, we have completed the, the policy manual. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Mr. Slickman, uh, I believe, sent you all uh, links to the uh, edits that were done. Um, he instructed you to send any questions to me. I got no questions. So Hooray. I'm going to assume that we're ready to move forward with the next step, which is um, putting your, uh, your manual online. Mr. First of all, Mr. Gilbert, I want to congratulate you on your pending retirement. You've done a really great job for us. And as a past sort of uh, employer as an MASC president uh, in 2004, which was a dog's age ago, uh, I, I really came to value your expertise and your friendship. And uh, I'm so happy that you've been our field rep. And we are going to miss you. You've done great work for us. and. Uh, and do your com be committed for your service to the association. So I have, I'm wondering if this job title of field rep, I mean, what, 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 what does that do? Do you place cows strategically? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, but, so would you explain to us what the next steps are? We vote to approve the new manual, and then what's going to happen in terms of publication? Sure. So... Um, what will happen now is uh, you will take a vote to approve the, the manual mm -hmm. um, in the shape that it is now. Mm -hmm. um, we will then mm -hmm. um, add the adoption date, mm -hmm. tonight I assume, um, to the introduction to that manual. Mm -hmm. um, we will then deliver to you a paper copy, which is your permanent public mm -hmm. record, um, and a, a copy of the manual on a flash drive in Microsoft Word. Mm -hmm. Um, we will then take those uh, Word files. Uh, we will send them to our third-party hosting service. Uh, they will load them up onto, uh, into their database. Uh, that will take roughly probably two to four weeks. Um, it could take up to a couple of months. It depends on how busy they are. Uh, but generally, lately, they've been turning them around in, in three or four weeks. Um, and then we will give, provide you with a link that you can put on your website and that will open to the, to the policy, to the online version of the policy manual. Um, <clears throat> from, from the point you approve the manual, mm -hmm. um, after that, if you make any policy changes, mm -hmm. um, you send a word file for the policy change to us, and we will load it up. It generally is loaded within 24 hours. Excellent. So that will maintain your, your online policy manual as well. Okay. Now, I, I've stressed before that what this is is a recodification of our present manual. We've made a couple of changes that we brought forward before, which mm -hmm. was in terms of adopting things that were missing that needed to be there. So they've gone through a couple of reads. So what I'd like to do is, with the understanding that anything in the new version of the manual that we adopt now is subject for the usual policy work that we would want to do. So if there's something in there that we're not happy with, it's the same thing as we had before, and we can go in there and uh, uh, make changes as appropriate. And I'm sure that with right. new regulations coming from the state and whatever legislation is going to be coming down, we're going to need to do this as a matter of course anyway. So for that purpose, I'd like to move adoption of the recodified revised uh, policy manual. Second. Is there any discussion? Anyone you want to speak to your second? To Mike? To, do you want to, you get to speak next if you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I want to thank Mike. Mike has been very good. Uh, 
as we were going through it bit by piece, he would answer all the questions, serious ones, uh, the ones that I thought were very serious and quickly learned that they weren't as serious as I thought. <laughs> and uh, wealth of knowledge, those things he wasn't able to respond to immediately. He got back to us as soon mm -hmm. as we could. So we, we, it was a very efficient process, mm -hmm. even though it took us a while to get through that tomb. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, just a question, Jeff. Jeff is not here tonight, um, or you're not here yet. But he, we had um, separately presented the f online fundraising policy, mm -hmm. which is which is in that set. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and he had asked, I think you to you to review it with your team and, and possibly with uh, the other council. But I don't know if I don't recall exactly what he was looking for. So we have not discussed it yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just. Um, uh, point to make, Len, um, that that particular policy was reviewed not only by our legal counsel, but mm -hmm. also by the general counsel of the Ethics Commission. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the Ethics Commission did make some changes to it. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's been, uh, certainly had a um, extensive legal review. Okay. Okay. Oh, please. Um. When it goes to the third party, I sort of mm -hmm. assumed that we would um, take the Word file and make it a PDF. W will it be searchable? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Word and phrase searchable. Um, also, um, all of the cross-references will be hyperlinked, and all of the legal references will be hyperlinked. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm trying to find. I had one policy I wanted to kick back to be reviewed by policy and I can't find the name of it it's the one that deals with approval of um, private schools and it had come up earlier this year not which I was asking which one was it it's LBC yeah I was um, gonna say it's in L but yeah yeah um, anyway when I was having to deal with it earlier, it never came to the level of full school committee, but mm -hmm. it became apparent that our policy is missing a lot of the specifics about when things need to happen, and there, there's work that we need to be doing. So that's because the specifics are actually in um, a guidance memo from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education that is available on the department's website. It is process, not policy. And so the policy basically says that you need to follow that process. Mm -hmm. We need to be doing things. And what my concern was that I felt that it would be better if the policy spelled out what we were doing across the board so that all schools knew that we were being, that we were treating them equally and we need to come up with this. We have to, we actually have to approve, go through an approval process for private schools in town, and we have to re-up the approvals. And Excuse me. Uh, no, you do we, not have to re-up the approvals. Uh, only that approved wasn't, once. Mm -hmm. No, that wasn't what I read on the, in the memo on the DESE website, is it said that we needed to do it more than once. No, they're only done once. Mm -hmm. Again, having that wasn't through this, what, Having been this, through this process multiple times as a school committee member, um, in my in in two different communities um, you when it when a new private school is established um, you have to review and ap approve that private school that they meet um, local standards um, you do it once as long as that school is in existence that's it I had gone through I talked with council he agreed that we did actually have a duty to re-examine on it says on a regular basis, I don't remember. I'm, I'm not aware and, of that guidance mm -hmm. from the department. That's, yeah. School committee is required. Anyway, I wanted to, I was concerned that our policy didn't address all of the things. You're saying that it's not something that has to be in policy, that it's in, let's see, the, I would mm -hmm. like, I would like policy to talk about that one and figure out what we should be doing. Um, I, I had multiple exchanges with our count, town council. He did feel that we had current duties 
to do, not just, it, it wasn't just a one and done. And I, I would urge you to on, have that conversation with um, a school lawyer rather than town council. I feel town council is well versed in both school and our, our town council is a former school lawyer for Boston School Department. Right. So mm -hmm. I took what he was saying as a reasonable statement. Um, so Sorry. I am asking that LBC be brought to policy for discussion, please. Mr. Schlitman. I'd be happy to have uh, uh, the policy brought to the subcommittee uh, and have a conversation with town council. That said, there's a philosophical discussion we've had going through the policy manual revision that things that are law and things that are regulation, we don't want to inscribe in the policy that we want to go and reference it out because if the uh, regulation or statute changes, uh, then our policy is in con uh, conflict. And so that consistently throughout the revision process, we removed language that quoted uh, either current or past regulations. Uh, if I may, policy is supposed to be what and why, mm -hmm. not how, when, and where. Mm -hmm. That unless a regulation or law requires you to say how, when, and where, mm -hmm. that the how, when, and where belongs to administration. Um, and ultimately, in this case, I would say in LBC, that your, your administrators do the work to get you to a recommendation to approve or disapprove of private schools. Mm -hmm. right. So. I mean, it's something we want to put in a calendar of things that we want to look at on an annual basis. That would be an appropriate thing to do. But to inscribe that in policy, that's not what we, we're, we're trying to avoid that, okay. that, that tripping over that. Okay. But we, I, I'd love to have uh, counsel and in, in discuss this further. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ms. Morgan. Can I move on to a different one? Is that okay? Are we done? So for, um, for ADF, which is the new wellness policy mm -hmm. in committee, we added a temperature mm -hmm. for recess. Mm -hmm. But when I look in section A of what we're supposed to approve, there's that sentence isn't there. So I have the notes from the meeting. Missing. Um, that Paul sent out saying we're going to add a sentence saying outdoor recess should be provided for students at times when it is not precipitating and the wind chill is above 20 degrees Fahrenheit past 3-0 in committee but didn't make it to the PDF. You know, that's sort of why we ask people to contact Mike, off, Mike Which, offline. Yeah. If you would Which forward I didn't me those, do. Just forward, <laughs> if you just forward me those notes, I'll make sure they, that gets done before mm -hmm. um, it goes to our third point. Mm -hmm. Yep. Any further mm -hmm. comments, questions? Okay. All in favor of approving our new codification of po the policy manual? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. That's unanimous. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much again for your work. You're welcome. I appreciate you. it. Um, if I might just, um, this is my last policy meeting as a, as a field director for MASC. It sort of closes a loop for me. As some of you know, uh, my mother was a 1940 graduate of Arlington High School. Um, and, uh, and I spent my youth playing up in the heights. Um, so um, it, it's fitting for me, I think, to be here tonight um, doing my last policy work for the association. Um, I've appreciated um, your input over the years, and I thank you for your service um, to the kids of Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy. Good night. Have a wonderful Enjoy time again yes, there in Enjoy. South Arlington. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, moving on, do we have any public participation? No? Okay. Then we move on to the budget needs request. Uh, the principals from the Audison, uh, the high school, and the Gibbs. You want to come up to the... <laughs> Hi. Um, Wendy Salvatore is here tonight. When, um, Ms. Salvatore is the assistant principal at Gibbs. Um, there was Ms. Uh, Ms. De Francisco, who is the principal, had a conflict this evening. But I can assure you that we've all been uh, working very collaboratively on all of this. Yes. Um, do you all have a copy of what Kristen and I put together? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I'm happy to be here to represent Kristen and myself. Um, 
We would like to first begin by saying thank you for your support that you gave us last year so that we could launch our school, which includes an embedded social emotional program and acknowledges the developmental changes that sixth graders are experiencing at this time in their education. In our first year at Gibbs, we were able to support five learning communities, and in those learning communities, we included math, science, ancient civilization, and English teachers. And in an effort to build a strong connection amongst our teachers, we also attached our exploratory teachers to those learning communities. And it has been very effective in creating a nice culture for our teachers. It has also made a big difference for our teachers so that they can develop relationships with students. We are able to now provide some small advisory groups. We have 35 small advisory groups that meet four times in a six-day cycle. The staffing that you supported last year will sustain us for the 2020 budget. We are supported, we were supported to create a schedule that is planting the seeds for project-based learning, co-teaching, cultural proficiency, and a robust programming around social emotional learning. Our numbers will increase somewhat next year, but not so much that our staffing for daily operations need to change drastically. The priorities that you will hear from us tonight are for the 2020 and then beginning our steps for our five-year plan. Our first requests relate directly to our staffing. First, we want to make sure that we are creating appropriate programming for our special education students that need substantially separate learning environments. To do so, we need to build our staffing out further to support our small group classes as the population of our students at Gibbs will change from year to year. This would involve adding a 1.0 FTE for special education to keep the groups of students as small as they have to be in order to meet state requirements. There should be eight students if we do not have a TA, 12 students if we have a TA in those small group classes as well as we will be able to create cohorts that will be based on students' academic and social-emotional needs. This additional staff add would accomplish this for us next year. In addition, we are currently staffed with a .4 FTE for speech and language. The current allocation has been difficult for us to schedule with the students on all of their needs on their IEPs. Based on our numbers alone, we would like to ask for a point two to be added to the point four, making the speech and language a point six FTE. The second staffing that we would need are in our areas of physical education, art, technology, DML, and world language. Currently, these classes are, long, are larger than we would like them to. There is a combination of number of staff and schedule constraints that have caused some of our classes to be unbalanced when our students are learning outside of their learning communities. Um, in time, we will have a better understanding of exact numbers for next year, but this would involve adding a .2 PE teacher as well as an increase in our world language staff, and we would have that data when we do our course selections later in the winter. Um, this year, the math department shifted to ask for each math teacher to take on an additional class intervention for their learning communities. This means that these teachers do not teach a project block. This shift helped us launch the first year at Gibbs, and we would like to bring back the original model and add a 1.0 to our math department with a math interventionist. This will also allow for co-teaching in small group classes. It will increase our ability to deliver tier two instruction and consistently allow math teachers to teach project block. Finally, we're looking for an increase in our medical needs at the Gibbs. Sue Frankie has been very careful to make sure that we are mindful of this higher medical need for the students as they move to Gibbs. It will be difficult for one nurse to maintain the daily medical care based on the data that we have for kids coming in next year. In addition, the nurse is an integral part of our social emotional wellness program. She has moved to the Gibbs from Hardy for this purpose as her work there produced the lowest number of visits related to anxiety over at the Hardy School. This decrease in number was directly impacted by her involvement in our social, emotional, and mindfulness program. This increase would provide time for this important work to happen, and we're looking for a .5 in our nursing. Our non-staffing priorities. Um, first, we would like to be able to build the professional development around the programming that we've started for our sixth graders. In order for this programming to be successful, we will be building professional development in the areas of project-based learning, co-teaching, and sustaining our social-emotional learning programming that we have already launched this year. 
While we have not selected specific programs, we support the special education request for funding to provide on-site coaching through a district-wide consult, consultant, I'm sorry, to general education and special education teams as we begin to develop a common practice for our teachers in our co-taught classes that is grounded in evidence and research-based practices. In order to support our project-based learning initiative, we would like to be able to provide classroom coverage so that teachers can go to other buildings and visit other schools that have very successful PBL. Upon their return, they would be able to staff some workshops. This is an area in which the district is trying to grow. Even in our infant stages, we were selected by the Maple, um, it's the Massachusetts Consortium for um, Personalized Learning. So the Audison has been chosen by Maple as a school to represent, or to present, I'm sorry, our planning around our launching of PBL. One of our projects for this first trimester was chosen, I believe it was a music project that Mr. Ham did with his students. So those students will be talking about their experiences and presenting their project at the Maple Conference in January. We will also be hosting a school walkthrough in April so that people can come in during our project block time and observe <coughs> what our kids are doing during project blocked. This is exciting for us and the district. This funding will help us continue moving forward with this initiative. And finally, to sustain our foundation for responsive classroom and social emotional learning, we want to continue to have training in summer around our work. This number would depend on number of new staff and the number of teachers that would be eligible for advanced training. Thank you for having me tonight. It is important that Kristen and I know, it's important for Kristen and I to let you know that um, the Gibbs has been a great place. We've had a great launch. Um, we are thankful that the school committee has supported us and that the district has supported us in our mission that we have done over there. Um, we want you to know that the parents have been overwhelmingly positive with their sixth graders experience. Students are happy to come to school. Teachers are working very hard to keep all of our new initiatives afloat. As we move forward and begin our work next year to launch our five-year strategic plan, we look forward to strengthening the programming that I have mentioned this evening as well as doing vertical alignment with the Audison so that we can provide consistent middle school experience. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hainer. Hi. Hi. Can you tell me uh, what's the total amount of staff, new staff that you want? The number? Um, 1.2.5 to 2.9. Okay. Call it three then. Say. Okay. Let's call them three. Do you know offhand approximately how much money it would be for the PD that you're asking for, the additional PD? That is a great question, and I will go back and ask Kristen what her magic number might okay. be. Okay. <clears throat> I think that's important for us to be, unless you have that. Well, the responsive classroom is $20,000. Uh, for a but I, 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 I heard that, but I heard the a couple. The other would be a consult. That would, would depend. It would be on a continuum. It depends on how much, how much time we have. This would be on a consult basis. If we had somebody as an employee, we probably would want somebody less than 0.5. We're going to need something concrete to put in the budget. So mm -hmm. yeah. I'd like that going forward. Sure. Thank you. You're and that 3 point, uh, 3.0. 3 .0. 0. All right. It was a one for special ed, a one for math, a right. point two. Yeah. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Can you, Mr. Carden. Thank you. Um, so a few comments and questions mixed in. Um, first, um, you know, Gibbs was robustly staffed compared to Audison this year, um, partly mainly because we went with five clusters, teachers only teaching four classes there a day, um, core classes a day. So I think when we balance between schools and as an administrative team, as you balance between schools, we need to really think about whether these priorities are in fact equal to the other priorities that the other schools have. Um, so we need to strike that balance given the way that we open Gibbs. So specific questions on special education. My understanding was that we had a relatively high ratio of special ed teachers at the Gibbs as compared to the Audison. So I would like to see that data 
provided, you know, how many how many special ed teachers I think per grade the level? Issue, the request is for the sub-separate programming. Mm -hmm. Given that we've lost the economies of scale and having three grades in which we can create programming and having mm -hmm. a single grade and having those numbers fluctuate, what we had to do for this past school year was look at the incoming students and create programming specifically for those students rather than having existing programming. So if five students came in who needed the programming for who had come from, say, the Dallin program. Mm -hmm. um, next year, those numbers coming out of Stratton may be different, and we know that we're not going to create a program that lumps all students together mm -hmm. um, so that students who need small group instruction because of their um, academic needs versus social emotional needs. And so what we've had trouble doing this year is to create that balance of creating substantially separate classes that meet the needs of students, whether it be for academic purposes or for social emotional purposes. And so one of the issues with going from three grades to one is losing that flexibility that having that has allowed us. So what is the additional information you're requesting? So the number of special ed teachers by grade level um, at each building, mm -hmm. and whether they're in special in, in right, sub, I just don't think that'll capture programs the or, yeah, the sheer numbers. Well, won't I mean, be it, if there's in. a total number of seven special ed teachers at the sixth grade, and twelve at the seventh and eighth grade, that might be okay. But if it's a bigger imbalance, which which it was, which I think it is this year, then then adding an additional teacher at one school. Um, you know, may not be their, their, that, that school may not be their priority. Yeah, and I think as we hear at the other requests for what Audison also has for requests, there's going to be some special mm -hmm. ed programming requests okay. as well. So we don't we don't have that data because John was never able to break out the Gibbs from the Audison. Mm -hmm. So we we just need that to provide okay. separately. Great. Um, on the math intervention, the same question. My I my I don't know how they do it at. Audison, but my understanding is there's one math interventionist that does two grades. So do you really need a full-time person or would a half-time person be be equal to what they're doing at the Audison? Um, I can certainly ask Matt Coleman. This was a you know request that Kristen met with the department heads and spoke with Matt Coleman about. Okay. I know when I was at the Audison, there was a math interventionist for the sixth grade, for the seventh grade, and for the eighth grade. So maybe they've gone to one for both grades. I'm not positive. Okay. And then the nurse, this would be the only school with you know, 500 kids that has two nurses. So there may be some unique need there because it's a sixth grade school or something. But I would definitely think that this would be a good situation to look for a nursing assistant because you already have a full-time nurse there all day. So why not look at a nursing assistant half time uh, rather than a nurse? I it can might be certainly a good... answer that question. It, this sure. is specific. Okay. Specific need that's coming from the fifth fifth grade cohort. Okay. Great. And I was going to say I can certainly refer back to Sue Frankie to find more information because I know that was a request that came from yeah. her. Yeah. I mean, that's still it's still a valid question though. I mean, it, it, depending on what the specific needs are, mm -hmm. you know, they do have training to deal with specific students, so it would would be worth looking into. We ha we have, but we can we can definitely talk a little bit more okay. about that. Mm -hmm. But we do have um, an unusual cohort uh, of, of specific needs. Now, will that kind of staffing be required in the following year? Uh, perhaps not. But it would follow the cohort, probably. Probably co yeah. follow the cohort. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Morgan, just to follow. So, is but is that that cohort must have some special staffing presently. I mean, they're, they're fifth graders, so they're already in yes. our system. Yes. So I, I would imagine we, like, how, how I guess what I'm, con I, 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 I like nursing, so I think they're important, and I think, you know, but I, I just, I don't, I guess what I don't understand is I get we're moving a cohort of kids from fifth grade to sixth grade, but then I'm like, well, so how are we meeting their needs? Well, they're in seven elementary schools right now. Okay, I see. So the aggregate need in that cohort is yes. significant, and it's being sort of yes. barely yeah. met. So not but, barely well, I mean, met. Like, at, at, like yes. adequately met by our like extremely capable nurses across our seven schools, but once they come together, they provide a, okay. 
Mr. Hainer. I have a question for the superintendent. Uh, we have separated Gibbs and Audison and uh, Arlington High School. Are we to assume that next week we'll have seven different presentations from the elementary? No, there are Because been I'm, I'm really concerned that Gibbs is now going to be treated as a separate entity. My understanding was we, and maybe it was just my uh, naivete, that we had a high school and a middle school. The middle school was going to be located in two areas. And we've always treated the middle school as three classes. Now we're treating it as one and two. And I'm concerned mm -hmm. about that because well, of just the things we've just been talking about. I think that going forward next year, if you want the two to be presented as a middle school, there's still going to be unique needs to Gibbs mm -hmm. than there might be from, from Audison. I guess my feeling is if there are unique, and I'm not questioning, there may be 100% valid, but might there not be unique concerns in each other's, of the schools? We have different programs in the other schools as well, and, and but we are presented that way. I. Because it's just one year, and it can be in isolation, I was hoping that we could find more similarities between the two buildings mm -hmm. than differences. And I, I'm just concerned that this is just going to add one more. I think the planning and the organization should be done. I, mm -hmm. I think it should be done together. I know all the elementary principals are getting together to prepare their program. I'm not trying to be in contention with you. I'm just trying to understand it. Mm -hmm. I'd rather have mm -hmm. unity rather than separation. Mm -hmm. Well, there be there is unity. Let me take for example the elementary last year um, not there was more of a need at Thompson to have a second social worker we don't have two social workers that are non program social workers in the other elementary schools I think there are sometimes unique differences even at our elementary level that's certainly true with Audison and Gibbs I think next year if the school committee wants to hear um, you know and, and I don't know if you want to come join Wendy at the table yeah, yeah. Um, we certainly can do that, but there are there are differences, as you will hear tonight, that are different needs at the two schools. So whether you hear them separately or you hear them as like one joint, it's the the, the issues. I may not be expressing it. Okay. Each building has its own population. Each building would ref these needs are reflected in their population, but they vary. The cohorts that we're just talking about are going to go up through this thing and disappear. I do not assume that any uh, social worker or person that you get as a result of a cohort, I would love to see them go up to the, your building and then if they graduate from there, go up to the high school and rotate through the program. Uh, but that is what's historically happened. They usually stay, they find a home, and we build. We don't uh, separate. Mr. Schuckman. Mr. Hainer's raising an excellent point and that the way we've done this historically has been we have an elementary pr presentation, a middle presentation, and a high school presentation. So the, the seven elementary principals come together and present a unified uh, vision of what uh, K-5 to, K to five is going to look like and that there's some discussion among them about how they're going to make a consistent uh, presentation to us about mm -hmm. the needs at the elementary level. To have the Addison and the Gibbs present separately, you're, you're breaking that up. <clears throat> and if we're going to be consistent in the way we do business in grades six, seven, and eight, mm -hmm. and fiscally consistent in terms of the, the quality and level of services and the needs we're making, uh, that it, going forward in the future that we should have one middle school presentation mm -hmm. uh, that is a unified presentation from both Addison and Gibbs that presents us with a package of what the vision is and what the needs are and, and what a request would be equitably through those three grades to, uh, to provide a quality experience. Dr. Bodhi, can I chime in? Mm -hmm. I, I think some of it is a product of having a first year principal mm -hmm. myself and opening another building. And I would have loved to have met with Kristen mm -hmm. and come up with, you know, one plan to give together. Um, I think part of that is just we're kind of getting up to speed. She's opening a new building. It's my first time in Arlington, first time as a building principal. And I think for actually 
this looking at the individual budget needs of the school this year it was easier for us to kind of look at our buildings and not necessarily had the time to get together and over you know look together as a budget my hope is that in years to come Kristen and I will be merging you know and having more of a one middle school experience two buildings um, you know it is something that I can see that the public of Arlington would want, the how the school committee would want it. I think in doing this process right now, Kristen and I know our buildings better and we're just trying to kind of get up to speed in our learning curves and trying to present what we think we need as a budget. I think hopefully, um, you know, as we kind of get more settled and understand the needs of each other's buildings and we have more discussions, I think that next year we'll come and we'll have one middle school presentations. But I did think it was, a, you know, from a purely selfish reason, um, it was easier just to kind of look at my building without having to go also and meet with Kristen and have her, a complete understanding of what she needed as well. So I think some of it this year is just a, a matter of time and two building principals who are learning their buildings and mm -hmm. trying to settle. Okay. I think we've had enough on this, on separating. Just real the, quick. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. And okay. I, it, it helps me, it makes me feel good about it. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Okay. Different topic? Just that it's like, Unfortunately, we're not going to we we're not going to be able to fund all of these like reasonable and totally legitimate requests. So I think I don't even know that the conversation in terms of talking about it jointly even has to be over even for this year. Like I don't think we've reached. I don't think this presentation is necessarily like a full stop of like okay, but we're doing it separately for this year. You know, having that conversation because we're going to be talking about this for the next like months and months as as we you know pull all these things together. And I mean, it would be great if we could say, oh, we're going to do all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. It looks great, but. No, we'd okay. love that too. I know, wouldn't okay. that be great? Folks, <laughs> so okay. anyway, we're getting thank derailed you. here, mm -hmm. right? This is whether we have them together. I'm done. Or, you can no. keep going. I know. Go ahead. I'm just, we're, we're mm -hmm. done with this topic. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think, is there any other questions about the Gibbs? Okay. Seeing none. Uh, moving on, can we have the Audison? Yeah, oh. but before we do that, can I introduce some of the people that are here too that are available for questions? Mm -hmm. Some of our curriculum leaders could not come for a variety of different reasons, but um, I think it's important people know Larry Weathers, mm -hmm. who is the Director of Science, uh, Denny Coughlin, uh, History Social Studies, sitting and right next to um, Coughlin is Rochelle Rubino, who is the new Assistant Principal um, at Audison. Behind her is Bill Papazisas, who is the Director of Performing Arts. And of course, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> we'll be on very soon, well, matching. Well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, thank you. Excellent, so um, I'm good. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. So first of all, thank you for having me uh, tonight to be able to explain what I think are the budgetary needs of the Audison Middle School. I'd also like to thank Dr. Bodie, Dr. McNeil, and Mr. Spiegel for all their help so far um, at the Audison with me coming in mm -hmm. on my first three months of uh, being in charge. So the my most important priority over anything right now um, is small class sizes. So I worry that many of the classes next year at the Audison at our current staffing level will be over 25. I believe that I really want to keep those classes under 25. I think having the relatively smaller classes will help us for, form relationships between students and teachers. I think it has kids participate more. I think there's more of a chance that we catch the kids who might fall through the cracks from a teacher's perspective. I think it's important for them not to have to worry about behavioral management um, strategies, but just have time to teach. And they're also um, given more time to give individual feedback. So um, what I'm going to present to you right now is um, a different list of things that I think the Audison needs, but is primarily focused on class size numbers. At the middle school, um, both at the Gibbs and at the Audison, we work in teams of teachers being English, math, science, and social studies. Currently right now we have four teams in seventh grade, 
three and a half in eighth grade. We're looking to expand the eighth grade to four teams, so adding two full-time teachers. If um, at a current staffing level, we would have over 25 students in every eighth grade math, science, social studies, and English class. And I really feel that's important to really get the kids prepared for high school and that we need to have those smaller classes. I'm also looking, hopefully, to add a school counselor. Right now, the school counselor caseload is about 287 students. We're seeing an uptick in all sorts of social emotional issues, not only in Arlington, but I think across the Commonwealth and, and in the other states as well. We're looking to add a counselor that would reduce the caseload to hopefully about 225, 230 students. Um, otherwise, we'll be over about 300 students, which I understand is a contractual issue for our school counselors to have that many students on their caseload. I am looking for a, a 1.0 world language teacher that would be divided into 0.6 of a Spanish teacher and 0.4 of a French teacher. Currently, right now, if we don't have an increase in world language, our 8th grade Spanish classes will average 31 students, our 7th grade Spanish classes will average 26 students, and our French classes will average 28 students next year. Um, obviously, in a foreign language where you want kids to participate, you want them to speak in their target language, I just think these classes, unfortunately, are just too big for our 7th and 8th grade students. We're looking to add a .6 PE teacher right now. Our current um, PE classes are 25 per class. Next year they would go up to 27. We also have 34 sections of PE compared to 40 sections of art, technology, and facts. Uh, it's a lot easier when those non-team times all have the same number of sections for schedules. It leads to a more balanced schedule. You see a lot more variety of class sizes when you don't have at the similar amount of sections. We are also looking for a point four music teacher. Point one would be an orchestra teacher that we currently have. I don't know if any of you were lucky enough to go to the concert on Tuesday. The orchestra was fantastic. There is currently 77 members of the orchestra, which is combined seventh and eighth grade. Next year, I think largely due in part to um, Jing Wei, who is our orchestra teacher. The orchestra would be over 105 kids. Um, it's a big space to find a place to have 105, 106 orchestra students. Um, I also feel that in Arlington, the music program has also been um, you know, a, a source of pride, especially at the middle school level, and I would like to be able to have a seventh grade and an eighth grade orchestra. The um, other point three would be for um, music teacher. Our classes are getting not over the 25 person threshold, but they're getting to be about 24. Um, it would also allow us to do um, a better job of scheduling. I did put down a point one administrative assistant. Right now we have 860 students. We're adding 46 students next year. So if you do the math, you have one secretary for every 358 students. Uh, we have 46 more. We would keep at that same level if we were able to get a point one administrative assistant. Um, for some of our special education needs, I know we had talked um, a little bit briefly with the Gibbs, we are looking for a sub-separate program for our summit program, so we're looking to add a full-time teacher to the summit program. I know Mrs. Elmer could probably tell you a little bit more about the importance of the summer, the summit program at the middle school. We are also looking for some of our current TAs to move up to B, um, BSPs, um, our TAs, um, you know, unfortunately do not make a lot of money. A lot of them are people who are looking to go into the teaching profession, so it's one year. There are other people who have as TAs who also look 
elsewhere um, because that's kind of what they, they want to do for their career, and I worry about losing some of that excellent support. The last um, personnel would be a 1.0. Um, we're trying to switch to more of a co-teaching model. We're having more seventh graders move into eighth grade. The classes are getting larger, and we're looking to expand the co-teaching model, and we're looking to add a special educator at the eighth grade level. I do have some just really quick supply requests. Um, Denny could probably tell you this a little bit better. I do have a background as a social studies teacher, and uh, Mr. Levy is also well-versed in this, so I'm sure he could answer any of your questions as well. But the eighth grade across the state is going to a more civics-based class, and that means that we have to change our curriculum. So that's going to mean new textbooks, new teacher's editions, new supplements, um, new digital access. <clears throat> We're also looking as the seventh grade is also switching a little bit of their curriculum and we're looking for some textbooks as well. Um, I think that um, Larry could talk to you probably about the, the um, new science initiative that was a few years ago and the new standards. We are switching over our different sixth, seventh, and eighth grade curriculum as well. And um, that's costing us, obviously, textbooks and materials. So unfortunately, many of the supplies we've had have been a result of things outside of Arlington changing our curriculum. And the last thing is, um, and Bill, could, I think, would be happy to answer any questions, that we need new coral risers um, because they're in tough shape. So that's kind of my detailed list. I'd love to take any questions that you have. Okay. Ms. Morgan. So I had two questions. One, we can, so the, the science resources, it looks like last year, so this was obviously not you, but just your predecessor. Yep. Like it looks, sounds like Dr. Woods came to us for FY19 asking for science and guidance curriculum materials, and we didn't fund it um, because we couldn't. So is yep. this the same thing, do you think? So I'm going to have Larry, who's a little bit more, uh, probably has a little bit more of the history. If he okay. wants to join us, I'm putting him on the spot. Thank you. And then I had one more other quick. Well, last year, <clears throat> me, the uh, sixth grade was at Bonison. And so we, we began our 678 rollout last year. And, and those purchases last year at the Audison were for the sixth grade, and those went over to the Gibbs. I, just the list that I was looking at from FY19, was a, it was a red item, which means we didn't fund it at all. But maybe we did somehow. OK. Thank you. Yeah, okay. I Great. think um, we, we were able to fund sixth grade textbooks. And, OK. And, and then there was a little bit of extra for some seventh grade textbooks, but we're filling that in this okay. year. And so this is the residual, the 42, yeah. whatever and now, is that? And the, three and the uh, request for this coming fiscal year is for the eighth grade. So then we will have the whole program. Uh, and and <clears throat> for each of those years, what we have done is we've had a uh, introductory year where the teachers get a classroom set of textbooks and they can explore uh, learn a little bit more about the new program with the idea that the following year everybody does it and they do all of it. Okay. So this year the seventh grade is currently exploring and next year the eighth grade will explore and the year following each of those uh, will be the full implementation. So this current set of seventh graders explored last year in sixth grade and are exploring now in seventh grade and are exploring again in eighth grade? No. Uh, almost. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I wasn't clear enough. <clears throat> because of the, the impending move of going from the Addison to the sixth grade, th there just wasn't the <clears throat> capacity for those sixth grade teachers last year to explore with the kids. Got it. We had PD. They, we had a number of PD sessions. Teachers looked through materials, but they didn't actually implement any of the lessons. This year we are having the seventh grade teachers do that with some of the, using some of the resources. Got it. But those same current seventh graders will go <coughs> into eighth grade and That's correct. in a sort of like, yeah. got This it. is a set of resources that are geared uh, specifically to the Massachusetts standards. 
and and so it has it has all of uh, what the mass frameworks has in the correct sequence, and so that's why we wanted to. It's, it's a little harder to get PD for that because the the publishers don't they don't they're not quite set up. They're set up for national stuff, but they're but they're doing this for us. Yesterday they flew somebody from Florida for a PD we were doing for our seventh grade and eighth grade teachers. So they're Great. supporting us quite well. Good. Um, and then the other question I had, is that okay? Can I do my other one? So I see, can you speak to us? And again, this was the request from, this is for you. Yes, yeah. so okay. this was the request from Dr. Woods so from last Hang year up. that she came asking for a 1.5 social worker at the Audison, which we didn't fund. Um, yeah. You can see the theme, right? right? And so now you're coming asking us for a 1.0 school counselor. And Correct. I'm just curious, like, they sound kind of like they like can you talk to us about like why is your flag like planted on school counselor versus social worker i'm, just, I'm curious sure you know. sure so currently right now we have seven and a half clusters and we have three school counselors um three, the all three of them have a social work background mm -hmm. and so right now it's a little bit difficult for communication so we divide them up alphabetically right now. And so what happens is you have, for example, Ryan Christie is one of our counselors, and he's going to have kids in all seven and a half clusters. What I'm hoping next year is that we would have two counselors in seventh grade and two in eighth grade. And so I think the two counselors that work together with the four teams in seventh grade and the two counselors that would work together with the eighth grade, I think would help communication. I think they would be, you know, more active with the teams. I think right now with 287 students per caseload trying to navigate seven and a half clusters, I just don't think it's a necessarily a good organizational structure. And I look at their background with social work and I just believe that if we had two school counselors per grade, the communication would be better with the teachers, and I think it would also be better between counselors. So I look at our setup, which to me, with kind of the, you know, I call it the alphabet soup, um, is a little bit more of a high school model, and I'm trying to have a little bit more of a middle school model. So for me, really, to have two counselors per grade, I think would be more efficient. And, you're and just how many noting, do we have at the Gibbs? You're just noting a nomenclature change, because um, school counselors, in general, we have moved from guidance counselor to, as a state, referring yeah. to them as school counselors versus school social workers, guidance counselors, whatnot. Okay. School counselors is a more encompassing term. So maybe it's all the same ask, yes. just yes. with different like names. Yeah. And how many school counselors are there at two? Okay. Yeah, so we have we have three. Um, there's two at Gibbs, and then um, we do have in special education. We have two other social workers, but they mostly their their focus is on kids who have IEPs and have it, um, you know, in their IEPs. Super, thank you, Mr. Hainer. Are we eventually going to electronic books across the board? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of the expertise of the um, curriculum leaders for that. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I look at the I look at the the math in the social studies and science, depending on you know kind of what they believe is best for kids. You know, I, I was a social studies teacher. I definitely have some strong opinions on, you know, digital textbooks for social studies. My, yeah. my, my concern is math doesn't change necessarily year to year. Science changes uh, six months before the, the book gets published. Right. Uh, social studies depends who's writing what, where, and when, yeah. <clears throat> things of that nature. And there's an economic value and a loss value. Right. Right. On it. So I'm just asking. Oh, no, no, I agree. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, you need to yeah, come yeah, to the mic. Right. I'm sorry? You got to come to the mic. <clears throat> our, our, our new science series is a digital text. We, we get a paper text as well. But every student will then, when we're done rolling this out, will have a digital text. And it, uh, I, I've been more and more in awe of it. The stuff that we saw yesterday, uh, 
it had five different reading levels. For the click of a button, you can, if a student isn't reading it well, it can go down a step or up a step. Right. Uh, there are 20 languages that the uh, glossaries come in, and that's a click of a button, and any student can access that. And many, many more things. The book can be read to students, uh, mm -hmm. for students who have reading problems uh, or auditory problems. So we are going that way. It's, it's still a, a, a stretch. We're not going exclusively that way because the publishers have their own plan for this and to, to get the paper text along with the digital text is just dollars more. So you might as well get them both. So. We also have to think about equity and, and kids being able to access the Absolutely. content at home. So going purely electronic would, would right. phase out some students and, and um, limitate, limit their access to the curriculum and the resources. So we have to keep that in mind as we think about um, the electronic piece of this. I think that piece, though, of the foreign languages helps to phrase some of the costs because our requirement <laughs> to translate into the books is, is horrendous as well. I think it goes both ways. Thank you. Mr. Schwick. No, I think the second language learner component is something that's really important in terms of the uh, digital text and the fact that you can have a embedded glossary that you click through and, and pull things up. I mean, you know, kids traditionally get stuck in that middle level in, in, in the continuum of moving into uh, English proficiency. And so when they're struggling to get past the social language to get into the academic language, uh, needs that aren't entirely visible because they're conversant and speak with with, uh, with a fairly standard New England accent uh, d doesn't mean that they have the comprehension of a native English speaker who's been brought through the language. Uh, and, and the digital textbooks do a great job of that. The other thing I want to say is that your discussion and argument in terms of the counselors for tying a, uh, each counselor to two clusters is a very persuasive argument because I can't understand how you run a middle school by dividing up kids alphabetically because you're, you're making a very valid point in that then they have to access every teacher in the building rather than developing the relationship teacher to counselor to kid. So. Yeah. Thank you. I think our counselors would agree. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So it's just more mm -hmm. efficient. Mm -hmm. Mr. Cardin. Thank you. Um, so two quick things. One is, since, since you're new, new here, <laughs> um, just to explain a little bit more about our budget process going forward. So we like to, to get an idea from, all, from you all what your requests are, um, but we do have a limited amount of money, so there's of a course. prioritization. Mm -hmm. We're trying to get more. <laughs> we know we have mm -hmm. a significant amount this year because of a, a favorable funding formula we get from the town due to our enrollment growth. Um, so we do have a significant amount of money, but it gets eaten up fast. You've got seven FTE yeah. here, yeah. you know, high school is nine. Mm -hmm. It gets eaten up very fast. So we do go through our prioritization process over the next few weeks, mm -hmm. few months. Um, and that's where you as an administrative team mm -hmm. will want to have that discussion. Mm -hmm. These class sizes that you would have if you don't have this FTE mm -hmm. are, are going to be horrible. Yeah. So to me, that's at the middle school level, that's the number one priority. And then we have to see where everything else fits in. But that's a discussion that you all have to have and give feedback through, through Dr. Bodhi to us mm -hmm. as a budget mm -hmm. subcommittee and as a committee as we move forward with developing the budget, mm -hmm. which needs to be done by February. Mm -hmm. So right. um, that's where we go from here. Um, then my second question was actually more about the five-year plan, which we're also working on, which is new to the district. That's something yep. we've ever done before. Um, and while I have you here, we're, we're probably not going to have another opportunity to go over that with you all. My question for you is about the additional clusters you're asking yes. for. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the numbers, are, the numbers that you're using are a little bit high, which I'll go over with the CF with John um, tomorrow. We have a budget subcommittee meeting, mm -hmm. um, so we'll get back to you on whether you're using the right numbers. Okay. But given given that though, still it, it looks to me more like you're going to need a half cluster at each grade, mm -hmm. not a not an additional full cluster at each grade. So just something to think about. I mean, obviously, if you want to go to the you know, the model where, you're, where they're teaching four classes instead of five, that's a different conversation. But if you're keeping them teaching five classes and you have, you know, 480 students, it really, the math works for 
for four and a half clusters, not five. No, I think as you look out for that five years, yeah. um, it, it becomes a question of what you think is an ideal size. Mm -hmm. So if you look at, you know, some schools who will say, you know, we want our average class sizes to be 18 to 21, right. it's going to be right. different clusters than if you say, I want to be in the ballpark of 22 to 24. And, mm -hmm. and I understand that. And I also understand, you know, increasing enrollments, the high school, I understand that, you know, I, I think I kind of get the fiscal yeah. landscape yeah. Um, that that is coming. Um, you know, when I put in a, a full team or mm -hmm. cluster, I'm operating hopefully that, you know, that act, that team could be more to 100, and I'm not sure if that's going to be right. reasonable or it's going to be financial sound in a couple years. Right. Um, there are some things that are easier for me to forecast right. um, because you, you look at, for example, the school counselors. Well, we gain 50 more kids the next year. That's 12 more on each caseload if we have four. That's easier for me to mm -hmm. forecast. Mm -hmm. We have 40 sections right now of art, music, facts. I pretty much know that those class sizes are around somewhere a little over 22, and we will not need to add sections for two or three years. So kind of the, the, yeah. the yeah. bigger numbers for me and the total enrollments and the lot of sections, it seems easier. Um, you could... I mean, you could definitely be right. I was going under the mm -hmm. assumption and looking at a five-year mm -hmm. budget that I would probably rather ask and forecast oh, yeah. a little yes. bit more right. than right. coming back with hat in hand and saying, like, I really have a good idea. Like, I really need, um, you know, an extra half cluster or so. Right, right. So. But, I, but I guess the, the, my question is, you know, are you trying – I mean, if you are trying to get to clusters of 100 – that's a worthy goal, but that's yeah. different than just meeting the enrollment growth, right? right. So yeah, I think that's yeah. something we need to, you know, as we mm -hmm. develop the 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 five-year plan, there's a sort of two separate things. One is sort of keeping class sizes under 25, which is status quo, mm -hmm. right. and how much you need for that. The other is, you know, possibly going to smaller clusters. We did have smaller clusters about 10 years ago, right. um, but they're long gone. So then that would be balancing that against some of the other things the mm -hmm. district needs, like assistant principals or, you know, mm -hmm. or, or a technology learning specialists or things like that. Mm -hmm. So we get this, this balancing again. Um, but, but I think just, just you need to be clear mm -hmm. as we go forward whether the goal is to keep up, keep class sizes where they are or drive them down to a smaller mm -hmm. size cluster. Right. So. I mean, of course, I'd rather have smaller <laughs> class sizes. Um, you know, I, you know, I'm trying to right now make sure that they don't go over 25. Yes. I feel like 25 oh, yeah. is totally. is a mm -hmm. tough number at the middle school level to have more kids than 25. Um, <laughs> you know, ideally, I would love to have 20. I don't know in this environment with the budget if that's yeah. reasonable. I think it's reasonable to be under 25. Um, I'd love to shoot for okay. lower class sizes, but I, I, I think I understand the budgeting you know, mm -hmm. implications and yeah. also in talking with Matt and Kristen of what we need as an administrative team. Great, thank you. So, Dr. Bode. I, I just want to reassure the committee that uh, I, all of our administrators are very aware of the, the, this process, but what we're trying to do this, these two school committee meetings mm -hmm. is to have a chance for you to ask very specific questions about these um, requests and and uh, because there's often not that opportunity at other times but we are prepared uh, to make a lot of priority decisions in January mm -hmm. as principals and curriculum leaders everyone is aware of what the needs are and then the tough task is to figure out when you put everything together how do you prioritize to the money that we could have? And then there would be some things that perhaps if we get additional money, would be waiting uh, for funding later. So we've gone through this process before, and in the process, one of the things that happens is that all levels get to understand what the needs are. And in some years, we, we agree as a group that the need in terms of impact on student learning and social emotional growth may swing more toward funding at the elementary level. Sometimes it swings more to the 
it, 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 it has a fluctuation to it, but it is in the judgment what we will bring forward to you. And then, of course, you will have an opportunity to decide if you agree with these priorities. And, you know, most of the time we agree, and sometimes, like last year, there was a couple of things that, you know, were very important uh, to the school committee. But, yeah, we will, we will do this work, and we are already beginning this work and have been. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I had one question for the Audison. I was just wondering, when you're keeping the class sizes below 25, what does that imply for cluster size? So you usually have, when you, I mean, we have five teachers at the Audison teach mm -hmm. five classes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think right now if we could have that extra half cluster, we'd have cluster sizes would be about 110 Okay. people on a cluster, um, you know, maybe 110, 115. Uh, if you have 25 or even above that, teachers would have about 125 to 130. That's a lot of kids for, you know, an English teacher to have and worry about correcting 125, 130 essays. Um, you know, and I think it does affect the education your kids receive because when you do have that many kids, um, just the, the amount of correcting and the amount of time that you can give to individual students, I think, is, is difficult. Right. That, that's, what, that's why I was asking the question. I think that's actually a helpful number for us to be mm -hmm. seeing as well as the class sizes because it does, I mean, it, it, it affects all the things that you mentioned and also just the ability of the teachers to interact with the students, yeah. how much time they have um, and how much attention they can pay. And... It, so I think it's a helpful thing for us when we're, t for us to know because it's in front of us um, as we go forward making decisions. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, okay, so I think we're set with Audison and now we'll move on to the high school. Right. But thank thank you. you for your time. Thank, thank you. you. very much um, so yeah first of all thank you very much for having me here I appreciate all you do thank you to the administration for um, the work we've done together in figuring things out um, and thank you particularly to our teachers and staff who've produced such an amazing school at the high school I always feel a need um, every time I get in front of a microphone and we start talking about uh, the list of places we need to do this and all the reasons why that's creating problems to uh, preamble that with appreciation for the incredible work educationally that this whole district does. Um, Arlington High School continues to be an incredibly high performing school. And as I say, I think to everybody ad nauseum, it's important to remember that Massachusetts is um, one of the highest, is, one, is the highest performing state, depending on how you look at it in the country. That if it was a country, it produces comparable results on the PISA international comparisons to the top performing states. So with Arlington High School having risen now to be ninth in the state of Massachusetts, we are one of the best public high schools in the world. And we do that because we stand on the shoulders of the middle school, um, two of them now, um, and seven elementary schools, and a lot of amazing teachers who work under some um, challenging conditions, um, and we make it work. So now we'll go into the begging part. Um, I really do appreciate the financial challenges that you have in front of us. And I apologize for the relatively large number that I will come out with at the end of this. Um, I went through this process a little bit differently than I have in the past, in part because I think I really appreciate that the school committee is looking to do a five-year plan as opposed to sort of doing it one year at a time. Um, I think to sort of figure out how we smooth things out and move them over time is a very helpful way to approach this. And then secondly, because one of the things that we have found is We've had many, many conversations about a point two English teacher and a point four math teacher and one more special education teacher. Um, and when we go through all of those asks, we get an even bigger number than the 10 or the 9.6 we're asking for. Um, and so doing a little bit more of back of the envelope and then figuring out how that then fits together over time is important. So I'd like to do most of my talk focusing on the chart which I went through, which was looking at five year asks and explaining what each of those things mean and how we get there. And an important part of that is to understand a little bit before I do this about how we do class <coughs> scheduling at the high school. 
At the high school, unlike the middle school, we don't sort of slot everybody forward into the next wave. Students request a whole range of classes, and we shift them around um, in order to figure out where we're going to staff. So it's not entirely easy at the beginning to know whether we're going to have a section of oceanography or a section of physics, because we're not sure which classes the students are going to go into. We can make some pretty good estimates and guesses, but when we are getting to the point two and trying to figure out exactly where to shift people, we don't know all of that. What we have tended to do over the last six years, that well, five years that I've been here, this is my sixth, um, each year our enrollment has gone up a little, now it's starting to go up a lot. Each year we've gotten a little bit less than the staffing we need to cover those enrollment changes. Last year we actually got enrollment, we got staffing increases that matched our enrollment changes, which was nice, but in the previous years, each year we fell a little bit behind. And the way we handle the falling a little bit behind is that we staff the core academic activities, the, the, the classes that are required, English, Math, Science, Social Studies, and World Language first, then we staff the core requirements in art, and then the electives we sort of work on with what we have left. The result of that is over time, although you don't see it necessarily in the class sizes in the core, you do see it in the fact that kids aren't able to get some of the classes and that we start to lose flexibility over time, and that leads to scheduling challenges that continue to get harder. So now let me just talk a little bit about the numbers. Um, with the additional 42 students that we anticipate next year, in order to simply staff two more sections in all of the areas for those classes, students take seven classes a day. If you have an average of 20 students in each of those classes, we're going to need an additional three teachers to staff those classes. That doesn't mean that every class has 20 students in it. It actually means that some of the classes have 25, some of the classes have 18, as we because some of the classes are purposely done for different things. Um, we then went through, if you look at the chart, um, looking at the fractions in terms of what we expect in terms of general increases over time. So we are looking at an increase in just general special education needs of a point two teacher. Um, if you go down to the next level, the house secretary is a separate issue. So last year we went to a three house system similar in the things we're trying to do as the cluster system, although different in the high school. So we have three houses. Our goal is to keep each of those under 500 students. We also scraped a little bit in order to make it so that we actually have six guidance counselors, two for each house. Um, that allows us to have a true house structure and guidance counselor caseloads under 250, which is the NEASC recommendation and the professional recommendation of the Association for High School Counselors. Um, I will go back and forth between guidance counselor and school counselor because I haven't gotten the habit yet, but it's the same thing. Um, so we made that move, but we did not staff fully the column house, so we still are needing a half-time guidance secretary, I'm sorry, house secretary to help that house in terms of keeping the office open and supervising students um, with attendance and other issues and helping Mr. McKnight. Um, so skipping down then to the next, I talk about historical understaffing, and that goes back to the argument I was making earlier on that we have continued to squeeze on the other areas. If you look down below, if you go down to bullet point uh, number six, where it's titled understaffing, right now, large class sizes in the core content areas are starting to grow. And as you can see, we pushed a lot of extra staffing into English, so that's the least problematic. Only 13% of those classes are over 25. In math, we're at 26% in history at 27%, and in science at 40%. So as you can imagine, next year, if we get additional staff, one of the first places we're going to be putting people is into figuring out how to have more science. That's a double challenge, and I'll talk about that at the end, because we're also lacking science classrooms. But having large science classrooms is particularly problematic in our building, because our science labs are too few and too small. So right now, MSBA recommendations are 1,400 square foot classrooms, we have only one classroom that meets that requirement. So when you've got a class that's over their recommendation of 20 to 23, and those classes are at 25, 27, and 30, it really limits what teachers can do in terms of lab science and can create safety issues in terms of moving around. And even in our labs, some of those not only are 1,000 square feet, but they're 1,000 square feet with a post in the middle. So they're particularly problematic. So that's one of the areas we would look. So if you look, at the other area, if you look as well, is in our general electives. So if we don't have enough electives, students end up with holes in their schedule. 
The other thing that they get in addition to holes in their schedule is imagine I've got a kid who's taking algebra one but wants to drop a level. In order to drop a level, they have to switch what period they want to do that in. They're not able to switch that period because they can't get into any electives after school starts. So in particular, if you just do the simple math, we could have easily, we had more enough requests to run an additional two or three sections of culinary. We had enough requests for the required art class last year to run an additional two or three sections of the introductory art class. All of those sections are full. So that's one FTE there. If you simply staff appropriately the science sections that are too large, that's another FTE there. So that's simply bringing us back down to where we ought to be. If we get the three FTE I mentioned at the beginning, those ratios will stay the same because that'll just go into continuing the increase. Um, the next, which I'm really very excited to talk about, is co-taught and inclusion classes. And that is an investment on the part of the school district in really supporting students for achieving at a high level. So a few years ago, we began looking at, so if you think about our curriculum, at the high school we have high school honors, college prep, which we call curriculum A, and then what we call curriculum B. Curriculum B is a modified standard. It is not a college and career ready standard. Students can achieve at that level. Many of the students do achieve the MCAS and get a full diploma, but it's not teaching to the full state standards. Um, what we found starting about three years ago was that when we appropriately staffed sections with a mix of special education, high needs, and other students with additional time and resources, those students who have traditionally been <coughs> placed in curriculum B classes were able to master the curriculum A standard. So it becomes really be imperative for us if we know that those students can achieve that standard, if we just give them the setting and the appropriate education, we really need to work in that direction. So last year, um, in all of the core content areas, we created co-taught sections where students are being taught to a curriculum A level, and there are two teachers, a regular education teacher and a special education teacher working together. That has been effective at teaching those students to a higher level and at meeting the curriculum A standard. However, um, the result has been, in a lot of those classes, a concentration of higher needs students. So if you're working towards a co-taught model where students are working with other students at the curriculum A level, you don't want a section where 10 or 15 of those students are special education students and the other 10 or 15 or whatever, so it's more than half. Because in the end, you end up with a section which is not really having peers that are working at that same level. So we knew that we would have that challenge going into the first year. We did it with the staffing that we have. We've had success with that. But if we're going to move to a truly co-taught inclusion model, you really don't want more than 30% of a typical class or about a third of a typical class to be students who are on IEPs who have special needs. You want to be able to mix those students with other students in a typical curriculum A class with additional support. In order to do that, we need to add sections, uh, additional sections in each of the core content areas in the required classes. So at the moment, we're asking for 1.4 FTE to do that. Um, Bullet point nine, which talks about compass and specific student needs, is analogous to the conversation you had about the Gibbs. Sometimes we have one or two or four high need students who require programming at the high school. Now we have a choice at the high school if we're going to support those students. We can send them out of district at a cost of fifty to one hundred thousand dollars a student, which is neither as good for the student or as good for our programming nor the commitment we have as educators, or we can try to build programming for them here. That can be a hard thing to hear as a school committee because it may be that you're asking for one staff person for four kids, but understand those four kids are going to cost us twice as much as they go out of district, and they're not necessarily going to get as good results. We really believe in keeping students in the school. So right now we have, in terms of our sub-separate and specialized programs, we have our summit program and our reach program. At the middle school, they have a compass program. The high school, that program had gone, been existing in the past, but had gone away. Um, we have been building up the capacity to support those students at the high school, and we want to hold on to them. So we want to build that Compass program back out again next year. That requires one more FTE. And then to allow our Summit and Reach programs to serve the needs of the students in the programs, we need an additional FTE. So that's a hard ask, I know, when we're talking about, you know, a small number of people and teachers are expensive, um, but it really is necessary to support the needs of those students. While we're on the special education, actually these last two bullets, I apologize, 
Allison and I double counted. Um, so actually, it doesn't change the ask for this year, but it does change the ask for next year. Um, right now, we're requesting a 0.6 FTE for special education. At various points in the last six years, we've actually had 1.5 um, FTE of team chair, and it's been absorbed or shifted in other ways, but it really is becoming a need. Um, with the addition of those higher need students in those specialized programs, um, educational planning becomes more complicated and therefore requires more attention. In addition, we have the just simple enrollment growing in the high school so that, you know, where we, so we had a position then at various points in the past with 1,200 students was one to one and a half team chairs. We're now going to be hitting 1,450 or so, and we're only going to have one team chair. And so after a point, we start having compliance issues. So we're asking for the 0.6 FTE team chair this year, and then next year we would build that out to a full-time position with the service-only team chair. So actually you can delete, uh, if you look in the column, the uh, 0.4 next year for team chair can go away, and the service-only private chair could be 0.4. So it's really only one position, not one and a half. Um, I apologize for getting my numbers wrong. So that's the basic numbers around staffing. And then I also want to talk a little bit about what we've been doing in the school with those deans and with those uh, school counselors and with the social workers to really work on a system of effective support for students. Starting two years ago, we piloted an approach called collaborative problem solving in the school. A number of staff, all of the deans, a number of guidance counselors went out for a two and a half day training on collaborative problem solving. All of our guidance staff, um, social workers, and a lot of other support staff had introductory training, and then the entire staff um, was introduced to the concept of collaborative <coughs> problem solving. Collaborative problem solving is a positive approach to school discipline and student behavior. And it works from the concept that students succeed if they can. And it's important to think about what that means. Most of the time, our disciplinary code works on the F idea of students succeed if they want to. And the issue is, we know that that's not really true, but the reality is what do we do if you do something wrong? You know, if you come late to class, you get a detention. If you act out in school, you get a suspension. So we want to make you, you want to behave better because you know the consequences are bad. And the idea of collaborative problem solving is that students succeed if they can, that the problem is a developmental one and requires skill development. And so the staff have been working on sitting down with students and going through a process of identifying the lagging skills and unsolved problems, helping the students work on building those skills in order to be successful. We've had really remarkable success. I've been um, very surprised at the skill of the deans, their eagerness to attend to it, the work of the school counselors and the social workers to adopt it, and frankly, the work of the teachers to embrace that approach. That when you send a kid to the dean, instead of saying, um, you did something wrong, I'll punish them for you. The deans are sitting down and trying to figure out a solution so the student will be successful in the class. And I mean, the simple numbers can be dangerous, but really the amazing thing is that if you go back two years ago, we had 76 suspensions. Last year we had only 40. 24 of those were in the month of May. Um, so we got through all of last year with 16 suspensions over the course of a full year. Now that will go up and down. Vaping and THC are a challenge this year, and so we may find that suspension levels go up, but general behavior around um, student detention, student um, conflict in the school are improving at a remarkable rate. So this year, we, are, we did a readiness survey last year. This year, that team of folks that had advanced training are getting coached um, every other week on the process by folks from MGH um, so that we can really get better and eventually be trained to be trainers ourselves. We'll be having another cohort of folks go through that advanced training. And my plan is that next year, we will actually train the entire staff. Um, MGH is excited enough about this that they're rewriting their curriculum so it fits into the way we do things here because it doesn't fit into the way schools work otherwise. They're like, oh yeah, two and a half days for the entire staff. And I just laughed. I said, I can come up with the money, but I can't come up with the time. Um, that will cost about $50,000. This past year's work has been grant funded primarily and scraped together from other PD funds, but it is something I think we need to make a commitment to. Um, in addition, and I'll just wave my hand at those, we've done a lot of work on social emotional learning. They're big issues, they just don't have a lot of time for them right now, and cultural competency over the last year. There have been a lot of training, a lot of work with students, um, and the big efforts we made were Wellness Day, 
and um, Inclusion Day, which we piloted last year, and we had Wellness Day today, Thursday, just yesterday, um, this year, which uh, we learned a lot of good and bad things from. We're going to have to change the format a little bit. We made it a little bit too easy for kids to skip school yesterday. Um, so the kids who came had a really positive experience. We had some wonderful programming, um, but we need to work on attendance. Last year they hadn't figured it out. I think they did this year. Um, but we're working on Inclusion Day for the spring. Um, digital technology continues to be an area of need. Um, there is a plan that um, Dr. McNeil has been working on with Mr. Good. Um, they've done really a remarkable job of making sure that our needs are covered this year. I want to give them huge kudos. Instead of scraping and wondering whether you can get it, they've been really planfully thinking about making sure that the technology gets to the right folks. So when they come and give you a number, you should trust them because we've been working with them really well. Um, and then last but not least, the building, which is consuming everyone's um, dreams, but not necessarily everyone's day to day. So we're planning for a new building. We're very excited about it. We think it will have a huge positive impact on the students. But we are going to live in this building for the next four years. Um, in the next year, if we get any of those teachers you're looking for, we're going to need three more classrooms. And if we get any of that science coverage, we're going to need another lab of some sort. We have at the moment nine, over 90% usage in the labs. There's just no place to put people. Um, and so while you're doing your budget planning, a new classroom ends up costing around $15,000 in furniture, paint, and other repairs. A lab can cost as much as $70,000, depending on what you have to do. We'll try to put it in a place where there's plugs and plumbing. Um, and then we really do need to make sure that we make time and effort, because uh, the restrooms in the building are horrible. The doors, the 55 doors that we have, are not built for the kind of use they get. They're old. It would cost you know, over $100,000 to fix them all, but every year we spend ten dollars to $50,000 just repairing and supervising and getting cameras to make sure we can keep the building safe. It's a wonderful thing that we have such a safe community and such great kids that for the most part, even though, even though we can't necessarily control all of the exits, the control and safety in the school is really positive. So um, I appreciate, again, everything everyone has said. Let me just check my notes. Um, and I also just want to thank Allison Elmer for trusting me to handle the special education part of the, the ask because um, I think it's really important that it's seen as something that is part of the whole program. So I appreciate that we didn't deal with it separately. Um, but if you have any questions, you should ask her. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Schlickman. Very thoughtful presentation. Uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate, uh, very much appreciate the fact that you went through with the grid at the beginning, looking at staffing on a formula basis. Because from this seat here, when we're dealing with a high school, I want to give you enough FTEs to do what you need to do. I don't want to count English teachers and math teachers. I want you to be able to do what you said you're going to end up doing at the end of the scheduling process is count up the student requests and aligning the staff to the student requests rather than the opinion of the school committee as to what you should have. So I'm very appreciative of this and I support the way you built this. Uh, so I, I've got the, one question here uh, that you're talking about $15,000 per uh, classroom, assuming that we're going to do some other jury rig board, boards and whatever, that, like these diagonal rooms and silliness we have. So if when we do the renovation or the, the rebuild of Arlington High School, we know we're going to need portables, or at least my assumption is, no, nope, we're not no. going to need portables at any point in this? No no. Oh, so we're going to be able to swing across this without, okay. I, I'm sort of in the dark here as mm -hmm. to exactly yeah. how the, 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 the plot thickens through the, the construction process. We're going to be able to house everybody over here while we're doing this and swing them? Yeah, swinging, spacing, the two buildings in the front first and then we start moving mm. people at, well we can go through the f whole phasing process with the committee yeah yeah, yeah that'd be we, helpful we want basic simple versions we won't move anybody mm -hmm. for the first two years mm -hmm. and then we're gonna have a new building out front mm -hmm. but um, we won't be tearing down a lot of the classroom spaces until very near to the end yeah so we'll have plenty of space so so that we need to get from now to the point where the front is open at that point, the pressure will be relieved and we don't have to go forward. So this is just sort of a stopgap until, uh, let's, let's say if we start construction in 2020, 
we're how how long do we have to go before we can start to move out front? Two years. Two years. Eighteen months. Eighteen months. January of twenty twenty two. Okay. So I, I just want to get that set in my mind, and because I'm not in the building committee, I don't have that. So between now and January twenty twenty two, the question is, where are we going to put make the school work with the the yeah. what you have? Yes. Well, yeah. that is the challenge, mm -hmm. right? Um, and. That has been part of our challenge, actually, as long as I've been here, which is that people keep saying we're going to get a new building, so let's not spend money on that. Um, but um, the reality is, and some of this will be about space, there are, there, are, there are probably going to be programs that will start moving out next year, which will make space for us um, because we're going to need those new classrooms mm -hmm. before we get the new building, mm -hmm. um, but we will need to furnish those classrooms. And that's, you know, we're not doing fancy jobs. We're getting basic desks and tables. Mm -hmm. We're getting projectors and screens. We're painting things. Mm -hmm. We're putting in electrical and Wi-Fi. But it, it costs money. Yeah. We might be able to do it for $8,000 a classroom, but we're going to have to do it. And then the, the biggest challenge, which I know is a real challenge, is we need a science lab. Mm -hmm. um, and there are... A few rooms in the building, don't mention whose they are because someone's in them now and they don't want to lose them, mm -hmm. but there are build rooms in the building that have plumbing, that have um, electrical, that mm -hmm. potentially could be used for physics labs, chemistry labs, mm -hmm. um, more likely actually physics or biology than chemistry, um, and they cost money to outfit. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I appreciate, honestly, we put a lot of money into the new CAD lab. Mm -hmm. um, we had to run wires out there. We put a whole bunch of new computers in there. Mm -hmm. Um, in order to put the electrical in mm -hmm. there. But we also took away a library classroom in order to do it, and we took the old CAD lab and turned that into a physics classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I mean, that's what we had to do every year. Yeah, it does pain me to put money into a building that we're going to demolish in four years, say, you know. But mm -hmm. yeah, we do need to run a school for the four years, and we have to maintain. So that, that's why I need to know exactly how this is working out and why we're doing this so that you know when somebody comes and asks us uh, why, why we're doing it this way and why we're putting in the budget we've we, we've got a ready-made answer it, uh, and I'm going to ask the superintendent the question was raised on the uh, uh, preschool application form that there's a line at the bottom regarding uh, there may be a change in fees, there may be a change in location, there may be a change of hours, and people are asking about that. And I assume that this is part of it? Well, one of the things we, from the very beginning of the high school project, we have felt strongly about is that when we actually get into construction, that this is not a building we want little kids to be in. Mm -hmm. So we have been planning from the very beginning as to what will happen with the preschool. And, and you know, at, at this point, you know, one of the things that's, that's been certainly out there in the public is we are looking at the Parmeter School mm -hmm. uh, in order to do some uh, renovations there that would be necessary. For example, if we put the preschool there um, and, and, and that preschool would be there for a number of years, mm -hmm. it would be through the entire project. Um, we have to put an elevator in. So there are things that we have to do in order to be able to um, house the preschool. So yes, hours are not something I would be prepared to talk about tonight. Um, and when the, middle, the preschool could do that, we're still <clears throat> doing a study on that. Mm -hmm. But that is the thought. Um, and if we were to do that, for, first of all, when the construction begins on the high school, the front entrance here mm -hmm. is not going to be the front entrance for mm -hmm. doing anything. So we have to move administration mm -hmm. and uh, to the back of the building, which will be the new front entrance for a while. Mm -hmm. So there's, a, there's some retrofitting that's going to have to go on. But that would, with the preschool moving, that would open up some uh, space from additional. But that doesn't solve next year. Mm -hmm. And therein lies one of the challenges, is how to... Um, create some space for next year. Because one, one of the things is that on Facebook, I saw this post about the preschool and the line, I, I didn't copy it, but it said uh, the, the application has a line pending a school committee decision. And here I am in the school committee now that I've got people uh, with that line on their application form. Uh, 
sort of questioning that and whether or not it's on the agenda for us tonight. Uh, that was just mm -hmm. the fee structure. If there were any change in fees, it has to um, mm -hmm. be approved by you. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's just a disclaimer because we sent it out earlier in order to get people registered earlier that we don't know where you're going with that. So right. it's just... Yeah. Well, the well, specifically, it says, please note that the 2019-20 yeah. tuition rates are under review by the school committee for possible increase, as well as start and end times, possible 2 p.m. end time for mm -hmm. full day, 11 a.m. end time for half day. In addition, there may be a need for classrooms to be relocated based on school environment. Right. That's yeah. that so, what it said. Yeah. So, it's a little broader than just the fees. So, so that, that means people are going to come talking to us about this. Right. So I, can, I'm left okay, in can the I, can, I, can I answer no. a little bit more on that? Um, we fully know that any fee changes it has to go to the school committee, which would go to the budget subcommittee. Mm -hmm. we, we don't know the proposal yet. In January, I'm going to come to you with a recommendation on the start time for the high school. Mm -hmm. That has a domino effect on the preschool because when would the preschool start? Because we can't have it starting at the same time in the high school. Mm -hmm. so, th so that's why they had to put a disclaimer in because there are decisions that have not been made yet need to make sure that people are aware that there could be these changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if the disclaimer has the word school committee in it. Uh, well, you have to, you it, have to change yeah, but the, the this, fees. This yeah. puts people in a position of, oh, we got to talk to the school committee about okay. that. Okay. I see. Okay. okay. It was because it says under review by school committee and none of us know mm -hmm. about it. So that's, I think, where mm -hmm. people are having problems. I, I think she but, just was trying to get it out because people are asking when is the registration and knowing that those are decisions that needed to be made. She wanted to get something out I to see. them. So she was just putting the disclaimer. I see. Mm -hmm. Possibly not worded correctly, but just wanting people to know that there could be changes. Uh -huh. But people are also asking, I'm trying to set up my schooling for next mm -hmm. year. The private preschools are already doing this. Why are you doing this? And so. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. we're gonna loop back to the high school now. Yeah, yeah. let's get back. <laughs> Mr. Carton. Um, so, so thank you for the numbers about class sizes. I may be coming to you for, for more of that data, mm -hmm. particularly when you, when you talk about you know, the students that like, can't get into some of their mm -hmm. sort of elective choices. If you had some more data on that, that would be helpful as we're putting together our five-year plan to talk about that need. So it, can I just respond sure. a little bit to that? Of course. Um, it, is a we ha it is a challenging metric to come up with mm -hmm. because it is a metric on stuff that doesn't happen, ah, okay. right? Um, I actually, we just had a conversation about this, I think next year, we're gonna, I, I, and I haven't put this with Sarah Bird, but I think I'd like to have a th basically a little table that guidance keeps track of when this, every time this becomes an issue, mm -hmm. you just check it off so that we have a tally. Because what it ends up becoming is, it's the volume and frequency of the uh, agonized emails to me and other administrators that I have this kid who's trying to do this, that, and the other thing, and there's no way to do it because we have gridlock. Um, and then what ends up happening is, of course, just no change in the schedule um, and an unhappy person. So it is, it's, it, it is something we need to track. I don't have good numbers on it though. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I'm very excited about the inclusion <clears throat> programming. I think that, that's great. Uh, on, the, on the Compass program, I'm, I'm a bit more skeptical. Um, I mean, <clears throat> a lot of those kids are going to the lab program. They're not going to $100,000 private schools. The lab is a public program. There's no rational reason why our program should be, except for the transportation cost, and the fact that the kids have to go to, out of town, there's no rational reason why our program necessarily has to be cheaper or more efficient than their program. So I would like to have a broader discussion at the committee about reestablishing that program, what, what the rationale is for, what the multi-year plan is for phasing that in. One teacher isn't gonna create a life skills program. You know, you need to have somebody who's organizing community outings and doing other things. So I um, wanna table that for another discussion if possible. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Thelman. Okay, so, <clears throat> you know, the, um, the five-year timeline for staffing increases, this is usually Len's question, if, uh, so I'm, you know, ch uh, jump in and help me make it better. Uh, <clears throat> if sort of priorities, like you, you have on this page, um, three classroom teachers, 0.2 special ed, 0.5 uh, secretary, uh, historical understaffing, two, if you had to prioritize that, if we had to make a decision, at the end of the day, by the way. I hate it when you ask this question. I know, but at the end of the day, just to my children, do I like the best is the question. I know, yeah, that, that's, that's right. Um, well, we kind of know, no I'm kidding. <laughs> um, the, uh, I'm kidding about that. The, the, <clears throat> the uh, uh, you know, the school committee passes a budget and the, um, 
and we don't tell people exactly, but we have an assumption. We mm -hmm. operate on some assumptions. So I just would be curious to know what you would prioritize. Well, I mean, the honest truth is what we, you have to start out with staffing the core content yeah. area classes because right. those have to be filled and they're dealing with stuff where we are held set, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic. Yep. If we don't make sure that the kids learn their, that they're not going to graduate. So we'd staff that. We'd staff the special education requirements because we are required to do so in order to serve those students' needs. Um, from there, I would probably scrape and build out for, for um, inclusion because we have a real commitment to that. And the, because in the end, what we want to focus on is the most, um, the highest levels of need. Right, students, I mean, what we end up doing, for example, is our AP classes have 29, 27 kids in them because the students are independent, because the students can um, manage their own behavior, and they can manage their own work. But they don't get the relationships, they don't get the feedback, they don't get the quality of educational experience that they want to get. Um, so that's in robbing Peter to pay Paul, you know. And so, but the difference is between a, an AP or an honor student who can manage their way through a more challenging classroom environment and students who need higher levels of support with executive function, higher levels of scaffolding to learn. And if that's that student and they're not going to learn to read and they're not going to be successful in school at all if they don't get it, that's where we'd put those resources. So. Okay. Uh, class sizes for the AP, the honors, uh, I mean, are you finding, are, are you finding that there's, um, you're finding generally that there's, you know, the, the, one way to measure uh, success, I guess, in those classes is um, are AP scores that are AP scores consistently the same, um, or are uh, grades? Do, do you see any? Do you see any challenge with the size of those classes? Because here, parents tell me a lot that those classes are large, AP and honors classes especially. And what do you? Uh, is there any data to, to, to support the fact that those classes have any challenges for a kid? Did you get the question? Yeah, no, I do. Well, I mean, you have high levels of stress. You yeah. have high, much higher levels of um, you have much higher levels of anxiety and school refusal at our highest level in um, students right now than we have ever had in the past. Yeah, that's why our harbor and shortstop program has grown. That's why our you know the demands on guidance have grown. Um, it's hard in a community like ours with kids and teachers who are as capable as ours to go with just the AP scores. Right, because yeah. the kids will find a way. Yeah. Um, you know, they will, um, and, but the AP scores don't tell very much in terms of the depth and complexity of the learning experience right. because the AP tests what the AP tests. Um, what ends up happening is if you talk to the teachers, they are teaching more and more to the test because they can't do the deeper conversations and the deeper, deeper coaching. So just yesterday I met with the English department and the English department is feeling extremely stressed by the fact that the seniors show up and at the beginning of the senior year, they do their senior college essay. And then having done their senior college essay, they want to meet with and workshop with and talk to their English teachers. But their English teachers have very large class load sizes and particularly among the high performing students, they don't have the time or energy or bandwidth to do that with the students. Um, and there's not space to do that in the class if you've got classes of that size. You know, if you're an English teacher and you've got 125 students, um, and we talked about what that's like for the middle school, but the high school students produce twice as much writing, <laughs> right? So you give those kids a period of time to do it, and it's a lot more writing, which needs a lot more feedback. So I don't, our AP scores have continued to sustain their, our test scores have continued to go up. I, I think we just have to wonder how long it's sustainable and at what cost. Right, and that's not the only indicators you right. indicated. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Okay, so I had one question. Um, thank you very much. This is really helpful. Um, and the, I like the chart also. Um, so I don't think, and I don't think any of us think that test scores are the only measure of success, but it is a metric that's used on our district. Um, and I wonder if the inclusion classes are mapping to higher MCAS scores or anything um, for all the students who are in the class. Um, so we've only just started, but it was, I mean, two years ago when we began, you had students who would have been in a curriculum B class um, who are now passing the MCAS. They're small cohorts, so to map year to year with different groups of students is challenging, but we are teaching those students to a higher level, and they are succeeding on the MCAS. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. So 
That's all the questions we have for the high school. Um, do we want to do the value engineering yeah. first? Uh, so we know, um, Mr. Levy, we know that you have budget requests mm -hmm. too, mm -hmm. but I wonder if you'd permit us to go on to the value engineering section so that we can, yeah, okay. It's only gonna be a few minutes if you want that. So this has been put on the agenda. Um, the value engineering is looking at the high school building project and thinking ahead to whether we will need to make any trade-offs and thinking about what those trade-offs would be, looking at the cost of the building versus the features and stuff that we would get. I felt there isn't really a process to come back and talk to school committee about these things, but I felt that, especially for a lot of the education-related things, that we as school committee members should be weighing in rather than having, I, I don't, we haven't finished talking about how the process is gonna work in building committee, but I didn't think just building committee should be doing all the decision-making, and, and at least that we should be making our opinions known. Um, you don't have a handout now because the better handout that we have is coming. Um, uh, Amy Spear and I are working on something in conjunction with the finance subcommittee that looks at cost proposal, that gives more information than what we were getting from Skanska. Um, it looks at the cost proposals and talks about what the reduction, you know, what the actual reductions are and then looks at benefits, um, or what the impacts are if we were to make these reductions. Um, I couldn't share it with you because it hasn't been shared with the full building committee, but you'll get it next week and, and we'll have more discussion next week. But in the meantime, I asked if uh, Dr. Janger could speak to some of, I gave him the list, the draft list that we're working off of, and if he could speak to some of the um, reductions and what the impacts would be on the educational plan so did you have particular Kiersey just I'm looking and it was a long list yeah I think the ones that speak to you the most I mean the the big the mm -hmm. auditorium and the gym is helpful and then anything else that you feel like you want to chime in on so one of the things I think in terms of uh, I'm uh, sensitive to Mr. Schlichtman's comment that people are going to come to you as experts on this um, and there's an enormous amount of detail and time that's gone into this. So if you go back, the place I think that from the perspective of the school committee that's important to start is the educational program. So if you go through the educational program, which we discussed in here, but it's long, um, all of these spaces and the specific choices about making the spaces larger than the reimbursed spaces, which is most of what we're talking about, are all addressed in that program and the reasons for it and the, the recommendations. So I think that's a helpful place to go back. Um, but we can talk about the, the big ones. So the auditorium. Um, the MSBA will reimburse for up to a 750 seat auditorium. We currently have a 900 seat auditorium. Um, the community discuss, they will allow you to on your own nickel add seats up to a thousand um, for your auditorium. So we went around, actually a subcommittee went around, I went around, we talked, looked at other folks, we looked at guidelines for performing arts and we looked at our usage. And our recommendation was for the 900 seat auditorium. A thousand seemed a little bit big, 900 we figured we could probably squeeze into up our largest size. Functionally for me one of the biggest issues there is that when you look at programming in the school around sort of interesting things we might do, it's really important that we have um, a space that can hold half the gym, the school, and a space that can hold all of the school. So right now our gym that's being designed, that we'll talk about in a second, is also larger. That space will be large enough to hold everybody when we get up to around 1755. The 
auditorium will be large enough to hold half the school. That means we can have two gatherings at the same time where you're handling everybody. Plus, you just need a large auditorium for that large a facility. I can take two classes and run an event. If you look right now at our 900 seat auditorium, it is full for events all the time. Um, and choral concerts, all town concerts, all those sorts of things often have to run over two days as it is. Um, and so the 900 seat auditorium seems like something that is, again, and actually almost all of these things are either the ability to support something that we're already doing um, with the numbers we have, and in many cases really facilities we already have. So that's the argument for the 900 seat auditorium. The gym, um, the MSBA will reimburse for up to a 12,000 square foot gym. That's about the size of the gym we have now. It's not big enough. When we currently go down there for a pep rally or for any sort of an all school assembly, we don't all fit. Um, so simply for that, the argument to have a 16,000 square foot gym, which they will allow you to do, makes a lot of sense. In addition, the 16,000 square foot gym allows us to put an indoor track so that our, um, indoor, our track program can do conditioning indoors. Um, it's not a running track technically, it is a training track um, because it's only about a twelfth of a mile and won't have banked sides, but that will fit around the outside. It also allows us to divide that space in half and run two gym classes at the same time. Um, and so, again, if you're going to program for things like graduation, simply having pep rallies and all-school assemblies um, and other sorts of programs like that, we really want to invest in that larger gym size. There was a lot of discussion about a field house um, as something that people really wanted for functionality. The MSBA won't let you do that. In fact, when we put two of our gym facilities, because we have all PE spaces as well, next to each other, they made us promise that we weren't just sneakily going to plan to tear down the wall and make a field house. Um, they really don't want that to be something that towns do. Um, the next larger space is the library, and there's actually a very detailed analysis. We did about four different approaches in terms of the usage, the spaces, the size, and the scope to look at the space we need in the library. In our philosophy of education, the library is not just a place for books. It's actually the central learning commons for the school. It's where classes are gathering together um, to do interdisciplinary work. It's where we have presentations. Um, if you go to our library right now, it is a hum of activity all the time. Students come and get their passes so they can go to the library during the free time they have right at the beginning of the day. All three of those spaces, and this is important, are spaces you can't enlarge if the building turns out to be too small. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably the biggest argument to the community. If it turns out that we end up at 2,000, um, we can add classrooms on the end, we can move into district spaces, that's doable, but you can't enlarge the gym, you can't enlarge the auditorium, and you can't enlarge um, the library. Um, and so that's the reason for those spaces. I'm trying to think of what the other big ticket items were that were on that mm -hmm. list. Um, there's an additional PE space. So in our current facilities right now for PE, we have the red gym, which is 12,000 square feet, the blue gym, which is 7,000 square feet, and houses um, mm -hmm. rock climbing programs, we do baseball training in there, we run gymnastics in there, and then we have the pit. So in the new space, we're actually going to have a little bit less square footage with, oh, and the weight room. We have the weight room, which is 4,000 square feet. So our plan is to have the 16,000 square foot gym, a slightly smaller weight room but better designed, um, an alt PE space which would replace the blue gym that would be 7,000 square feet. So those spaces then provide enough space for us to basically replace the programming that we have now. I think that's it. Are there any big ones? Kiersey, you yeah, have the chart in front the, of you. That's I'm pulling it up. Um, if you could speak to the arts, performing arts spaces, the band chorus rooms, and uh, the Black Box Theater. I think those are the main ones. So again, we now have um, what we call the Little Theater, and that's what it's referred to as in the program. The Little Theater is about 1,400 square feet. It's a basement space, but it's active with all kinds of programming in terms of small, um, small activities and smaller programs. The idea in this is to create a space that would be larger um, and more basically built to the purpose. It is what's called a black box, but the idea is you make a large multi-purpose space 
so that you can either just practice in the whole space, you can divide it in half and have small performances. With a 3,000 square foot little theater, we could seat up to 120 folks for small performances. Um, right now we have the student-led one acts, which right now are on a little stage or the giant theater. Um, we have done other sorts of performing arts programs. Um, we've had improv down in that space. Um, but I would also imagine one of the nice things about having the little theater be similar in size to the stage is, so right now this week, we have had wellness day where we had to clear the stage. But at the same time, we had um, the band practicing for their concert. And tomorrow we have the eighth grade coming. And um, they were all very concerned. I just was down there because we have to push back the seats again. So our performing arts folks were moving them off, moving on. So in, if you have a sec, if the little theater is comparable in size to the stage, you can also do a lot of rehearsing and programming back in there while keeping the auditorium in use for all kinds of other purposes. Um, our band, if you've been to our band room, it is sort of a double-sized classroom. Um, it is not at all built to suit. If you, I, we actually went through design features and program space for a performing arts um, centers. For the size of our band, which will now be 30 to 40 percent larger than it is now, we really need, um, I think it's a 2,500 square foot band room. And similarly, the chorus as it grows in size right now, and Mr. Papazis isn't here to hear me sing their praises, but with changing and prep scheduling, um, we, we've, actually, we're, we've, we've actually made it so the kids are much more able to get into the choral program. We have 40 freshmen right now in chorus. If we hold on to those kids, I can imagine having a chorus that's upwards of 150 kids, especially as you get to a bigger program. Um, and so again, they need a larger uh, room size, and so we're asking for that to be 2,500 square feet as well. Um, and then there are other programming spaces around there. Um, in the art department right now, we currently have four art rooms. Those are heavily used. Um, and so, again, with 40% more staffing, we want to keep that level of use. We have a ceramic studio, um, which you can't go back and forth, and then the other art spaces. If we're going to keep those programs, we're asking for four spaces. Um, that one additional art room is not, again, a non-reimbursed space. But it's also important to remember that they give us a certain number of homerooms. Mm -hmm. They take the number of students that are going to come into the school. I'm getting a little into the weeds now. Stop me if I go too far. Mm -hmm. They give us a certain number of classroom spaces to run homerooms. Um, and so we have 60 classroom spaces and then all these other rooms that will be used for homeroom spaces. If we remove that art room as a non-reimbursed space, we're going to have to replace it with a classroom. So it's not that you lose the full, I can't remember, thousand some odd square feet. You replace that 1,200 square foot room with an 850 square foot room, and then you no longer have the use for an art studio. Science labs are another issue. We are asking for 17. It's unclear from their formula and our conversations with them whether or not the last three of those are reimbursed or not. Their language has one formula, but when you plug the number into their spreadsheet, it spits out 14. So we made the argument that their own formula says we should get 17 with the usage we have. Um, we clearly need it because if you do the math, if you're going to have 20 kids in a science lab, which is what you want, mm -hmm. and you have 1,850 kids, and you have 110% <coughs> occupation, so you're going to have 18.5 teachers plus another 10%, about 19.5. Um, those 19.5 teachers are going to need 17 labs. Um, they're going to have to share a few of them, but they'll already be at 85% capacity when we start. Um, so that's the argument we're making there in terms of science labs. I think the only other one would be the discourse lab, if you just want to talk about what we'd lose if we didn't have it. So in the reimbursement formula, they talk about vocational and technical spaces. And so in the design and sort of philosophy of the school, we wanted specialized technical spaces that worked towards the technical features of every department. So each department, you know, there's an immersion lab in the language, that's the language lab. There's the STEM lab for the, for the math department, which is our computer science lab. There's the digital arts lab, there's the digital production studio. Many of those, almost all of those, still exist in one form or another. For the humanities, for um, English and social studies in particular, but also for the rest of the school, we envisioned something we call the discourse lab. Now that takes the place of 
the way we use Old Hall right now for the most part, um, but it's built to suit. So it's a 120 student um, discussion center. So it's not a language, we're not calling it a lecture hall because it's not seats with a guy in the front. It's designed to allow people to debate, discuss, and I don't know whether Kathy will want to use it for the school committee room. Um, it'll be a very nice space for that purpose if it's designed appropriately. Um, it, it will be very useful for PD and other activities throughout the year. It's funny, it actually is one of the spaces which the most staff is the most excited about, which is why it has been moved front and center into the building, um, because people see many different uses for it. The plan is to have 120 seats, so that a lot of the time a teacher or a class will want to bring in a speaker, and that's a really nice place to go and have a really focused thing with all four of your sections or all five of your sections of a class. So that's the design of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Hainer. I want to commend you and members of the committee and everyone else on this committee. You've done a phenomenal job. Um, I think all the additional things, with some exceptions, of which I'll share with you in a minute, I support 100%. I don't think this school system has the right to have the quality theater and music program that it has with what it's got. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine what the program will be like if we get what we're looking for here. I think it will be fantastic. I have a son who was a physics and chemistry teacher. When I showed him what we've got, he said, you all should be arrested uh, for the, what we've got. Uh, the, the, we need to go forward. This is where it is, and I applaud it, and you have my 100% support. The seniors that I've had to deal with in the past, I think I've convinced a lot of them to go with that. That said, that's the good news. Mm -hmm. I think numbers one through four and number 13, we have to find a way. This is on the list that we have. We don't all have it? The, the, no, we don't okay. all have it. Then, then let, me, let me share with you, uh, and I think what some of them have already been dealt with, the comptroller's office, facilities department, IT network, payroll, and the school district offices. Uh, and I think they've all been talked about at uh, great length. I think we need to show the community that we absolutely 100% cannot find another space for them before we add those. I think the other programs that you mentioned tonight are essential to maintain the quality of the program and to continue the quality that's going forward. Mm -hmm. I think the theater program and the music program, I came from a district, Rotten Dunstable, that had a, a thousand seat theater that had the the, the, off, the separate rooms off to the side, the, um, the amazing programs that they were able to do beyond what they were doing before, it was just fantastic, and continuing programs. And they found things to do that they didn't even know existed before, and they've kept it going. So I support and I really applaud all the work you folks have done. Thank you very much. Anyone else want to, Mr. Cardin? Um, so just a question on the auditorium and the, and the seating. Um, certainly it would, be an asset to the community. I hope the community supports the larger auditorium. But I also want to be you know, clear with what is educationally required and what is nice to have for the community and for the concerts and for the things like that. My son's just a freshman, so he's only you know, a third of the way through the year, but there hasn't been an assembly of double classes in the auditorium yet. How often is that really used for that purpose? Well, some of that has to do with the ability to do it well, right? It's not a good space. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think we have, we have classes in there at least twice a year, twice a month, I mean, um, and other assemblies and other programs in there about twice a month. But where you need to have two grades in there at the same time. It certainly seems that way. Um, and sometimes we don't because it doesn't really work that well with two grades. The, 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 the funny thing about our current theater mm -hmm. is it has 900 seats, if you right. count all of them, including the broken ones. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually only the size for a 550-seat theater. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't really like to put everybody in there because they're really cheek to jowl when they're all yeah. there. Yeah, I just want to be clear that if we're not currently using it that way, we shouldn't be selling it that way. Okay, thank you. Okay, I would just counter that if it's not possible to use it that way. It's something we want this. to have, right. Not something we currently have. Okay. Mr. Shuckman. I don't think it's a want to have. I think that we've already demonstrated the need if every time we're having a concert or a, or a play, we're selling it out for three nights. Uh, to downsize from that in a community with a growing school enrollment is 
going backwards. And our intent here is to have a better quality facility that, you know, we talk about the performing arts folks having the ability to move, uh, to, to have the music facilities close enough to the stage to move in and out, and to have a uh, space where you can move in, in and out scenery and build the scenery uh, adjacent enough that, that you can re really do this well. And then this becomes a community asset and other uh, folks can come in and use it as well. If we've got 900 seats in there right now and we're filling them for events, um, there's a need in the community to have that, that, that size space. So I would, I, I would certainly argue for that and for having all the performing arts uh, uh, auxiliary space that go with it because we've got an outstanding program. Uh, we have an outstanding program and an awful facility. It would be wonderful to have them in a, in a, in a great facility as well. We shouldn't be going backwards. And if you, in the argument you made regarding the ceramics room versus a regular classroom, it's 900 square foot versus 1250, I can't imagine that being that much of a cost difference over 30 years over the entire town that it's worth re reducing the functionality of the building. Now, Mr. Hainer made a very valuable point for the things that are not high school related per se, be it town offices, or being us, the central administration, yeah, I think that within the next couple of months we should go take a look at what the other options are. Whether or not we need, we as a school committee and central administration need to be in this building or we can take these functions that are administrative and find another place for them and what would that cost us? But this is not a community that it has a lot of office space available and has a lot of uh, uh, ability to do that. So, but, but that has to be costed out, and we've got to be able to go to the community and say, well, you guys are building all this other stuff under the high school. We've got to be able to come with strict numbers that, okay, if we put this in the high school, this is the cost. If we move them out and put it elsewhere, these are the proposals we had. This is what it's going to cost for that and, and, and make sense of it. But in terms of reducing the uh, educational uh, components of this project, any cost reduction on that is going to be very, very small when spread out over the town, but a major enough impact on the lives of students and kids going forward for the next 50 years. You're right, you can't expand the auditorium if it's too small. You can't expand the gym if it's too small. We are adding classrooms onto Thompson and, and Hardy because we needed the space, but that's a mistake we can't make with the central space in this building. Can Mr. I just speak a little bit to the idea of sort of the empty theater? I mean, one of the challenges of theaters mm -hmm. always is you spend two weeks rehearsing in an empty theater, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, but it's so that at the end you can have a production mm -hmm. where the 900 people come in. Um, if you just go back in terms of programming, you know, we've had the winter concert, the fall play. Um, today we had the winter, the concert. Um, we We'll have the spring play. We have had Audison has to run two different concerts to split their school mm -hmm. to fit them into this space. Um, we are just we're planning for the spring inclusion day, mm -hmm. which is only really able to happen because we can fit half the school into the space. So mm -hmm. it, it's it's not always full, mm -hmm. um, but it is being programmed around in order to be able to create the event that happens in that space. Mr. Thielman. Yeah, I, I would just say you know if we built a 750. A seat theater, we would regret it. it we, would, mm -hmm. <clears throat> we would look back and we would say we made a mistake. So we shouldn't think about that. Every performance that we have in Arlington, just about every performance we have at the Addison Middle School, the high school, there, there's almost 900 people in those seats. I, I spoke at uh, uh, Duxbury High School last spring as part of some uh, something or other for uh, on, on my with my day job, and <clears throat> the first section, the first. Uh, uh, session was juniors and seniors and then freshmen and sophomores or vice versa and so they were able to put two you know all four all four classes in two different groups for uh, my uh, my talk and <clears throat> it was you know it felt good and it was a nice tiered auditorium there I don't know if you've been to Duxbury High so I we need to have the same thing in a town like Arlington and we can't we can't we can't be uh, foolish about uh, 
the size of the auditorium. It has to be 900 uh, seats. It's what it is today, and we really, we really, I mean, we have to talk about it. It's part of our mandate to talk about this stuff, but that's what it's got to be. And the um, <clears throat> the other issue to think about, to um, Bill's point about the district offices, that's a that's a that's a real that that's a that's a, a conversation that requires. It's not black and white, and it's not simple. It's <clears throat> there's a lot of thought that has to go into it. One is, you know, what works educationally, and two is <clears throat> if there, there may be a point, if you follow the current uh, projection in the growth of uh, the stu student enrollment in this district, we may reach a point where uh, we're gonna need more places for students. And you can move out the district offices for a period of years, five years, 10 years, um, and make those spaces into classrooms. And that's less expensive than doing an addition, which we would be forced to do if we don't have those spaces. So you have to think long term, you have to think 50 to 100 years, long, long after most of us will be gone, uh, one way or the other, from the town of Arlington. And uh, <clears throat> you know, you got to remember that you're trying to leave something that's going to be used mm -hmm. beyond mm -hmm. the students who are in the school right now. You got to think bigger than than just mm -hmm. what's in front of us. Mm -hmm. okay. So I don't know. These are these are big. These are a lot of decisions. You know, the committee. And, and by the way, by the way, you know, there are. You should. The school committee should know that um, <clears throat> the the. Uh, the the committee is going to listen to everybody's voices, including the school committee's voices, and uh, there are lots of different opinions on the school committee, uh, on the building committee. So there are some com people on the building committee who are uh, of the mind of what Bill just articulated about the district offices. So there's a, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of different opinions on the on the building committee. You never quite know which way things are going to go. Okay, so we are going to have next week to talk about it and. I think formulate some kind of statement which will then pass on to yeah. the building committee. Are there any other questions that you have for Dr. Janger about the educational things? Seeing none, okay. Thank you very much for this and much. for your presentation. Thank you, Jason. Okay. And Madam Ms. Chair, if I may, I'm very appreciative that you brought this uh, topic up to us tonight. I think it's important that we uh, be involved and, and have these conversations and you're putting this on the agenda, and I very much appreciate it. Okay, great. Thank you. I don't. I don't want, I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to do my job. Um, Mr. Levy, sorry to put you off. The AEA would like to thank the school committee for allowing us to present tonight. We hope you will consider the following requests for the 2019-20 school year. District-wide, we are requesting an increase in the number of and salary of substitute teachers and TAs. This would increase the number of substitute teachers to meet the district needs, which is a major issue. Also, TAs are being pulled from their assignments with students to cover teacher absences. It would also help to get and retain high quality substitutes and TAs. Supplies and curriculum for all music and performing arts classes, an increase in academic and athletic stipends. These stipends have not seen an increase since the 2012-13 school year. Also, this will keep Arlington coaches' salaries competitive with other Middlesex League schools. <clears throat> Resume replacement of teacher laptops with the same type of device, an increased equity of technology among schools. Renewal of necessary online subscriptions and purchasing curriculum for all small group classes. Small group classes often have not been given set curriculum. Teachers have to make it up as they go. This will provide teachers with curriculum needed to teach their classes. It will also enable students to work toward common core and state frameworks. Lastly, increase funds for professional development course re reimbursement. For the high school, we are requesting an additional 1.0 FTE for ELA, 1.4 Science, 1.0 Learning Specialists, 1.0 social, social Studies, and 1.0 Math. This is due to an increase in enrollment. We are also requesting an additional 1.0 FTE team chair to create equity compared to the middle schools and due to an increase of workload and caseload. Lastly, we are requesting an additional 0.5 house secretary. This will provide all deans and houses with administrative assistant help. For Audison, we are requesting an additional 2.0 FTE eighth grade teachers. This will create four full clusters in both seventh and eighth grades. 
We are requesting an additional 0.3 FTE general ed music, 0.1 orchestra, 1.0 school counselor, 1.0 summit teacher, 0.6 Spanish, 0.4 French, and 0.6 physical education. Um, this will help to, not only is this due to an increase in student enrollment, this will also help reduce class sizes and improve scheduling options. We also request an additional 0.6 FTE administrative assistant. Addressing the social emotional needs of students means more meetings to be scheduled, more paperwork coordination with outside doctors and therapists, and more homeschool communication. We are also requesting an additional 1.0 FTE 7th grade inclusion teacher and 1.0 FTE 8th grade co-taught teacher. Each grade needs to have two inclusion and two co-taught teachers. In the lab collaborative report on Arlington's inclusionary practices, the co-taught program was commended for its effectively designed model with a special education teacher and full-time teaching assist assistant for a cluster of seven to eight students at each grade level. Additional staff is needed to reach the recommended cohort number, as well as keeping the co-teaching class ratio of students with disabilities to typical students below the 50-50 ratio. An additional 1.0 FTE for ELL. This will allow push into classrooms and differentiated instruction to meet the district's goals of cultural proficiency. Lastly, for Audison, the AA is requesting additional material for the following books and materials for the new eighth grade civics curriculum, additional thematic texts for seventh grade focusing on global studies, and resources and books for the new eighth grade science curriculum. At Gibbs, we're requesting an additional 0.4 FTE in physical education, an additional 0.2 in speech and language pathologists, an additional 0.4 in Spanish. This is due to an increase in student enrollment, and it will also uh, meet growing students' needs, reduce class sizes, and allow for scheduling flexibility. Lastly, the EEA requests a gifted and talented program. Teachers feel we are not meeting the needs of our advanced students with differentiation alone. Sixth grade had ACE at OMS, but it was not included at Gibbs, and staff feels it's important to reach this group, special group of learners. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Mr. Cardinal. Yes. Um, so I guess I'm a little surprised to hear about the, the laptop replacement. Is, mm -hmm. is that district wide or just it, certain subjects? Do you know? It's something that's ongoing with a technology committee and something we're discussing currently in the district. Mm -hmm. And we're working on a new technology plan, right? Is that going to come to us in the spring or what's? Mm -hmm. well, yes. Um, mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Whoops. I'm working with David Good. Uh, actually, um, we meet quite often the instructional technology department mm -hmm. and the technology department, and we also invite people, um, building administrators in to tell us what their technology needs are. And so we have created a plan for the high school. We just have to uh, define some of the other needs at the middle school and the elementary school level. But we are currently working on a five-year technology plan. Uh, and I know that the capital um, planning, committee. planning committee is meeting next week, so we plan to have the meeting, the plan finalized by then, so we can present it then. Oh, okay. So we'll That's see it right. soon then. Mm -hmm. But um, you want me to talk about the Chromebook? Yeah. So the um, some of the issues that have been presented to us regarding the Chromebooks. You know, when the, the rollout was done, maybe a couple of years ago, that may have been some of the issues, but I. Some of the issues that have been identified, we have addressed those various issues. And so I feel like we need to definitely have a, a deeper discussion with teachers and with building administrators as to what those needs are. We've also tracked what some of the um, technology tickets to help at the help desk in order to see what those issues are. Uh, some of the issues have been, like for one example is uh, the follow you printing, uh, teachers were having, you know, problems with printing large PDFs, but because of the various work we've done to the network, we've addressed that issues and we've saw we've seen a decrease in a number of help desk um, tickets for that particular um, issue. 
also we're looking at you know Chromebooks and being able to project on um, projectors. We have installed HDMI cables and HD and projectors that utilize HDMI cables in order to do those, to, so that teachers can project with their Chromebooks. So I am very interested in you know meeting with Jason in order to see what some of the other issues are that are, are relating to the Chromebook. Because we've gone to the Chromebook, it has been very cost effective because we're able to supply more digital learning devices to various staff that may not have gotten a laptop because of the expense of the MacBook. So because we've gone and we purchased a cheaper machine, but we still feel like it's functional and, and students are able to utilize it to address their learning needs. And we feel like the teachers should also have the same type of digital learning device as their students. So they're able to, see, you know, have that type of coordination and alignment. But we, we don't want to stifle their ability to do their job. And that may be the case in some of the specialized positions as it relates to math and science. But overall, I've, you know, the issues that we've been able to address with the Chromebook have been addressed. So I am interested to see what those other issues are that you know we that's we don't seem to be meeting. So I'm just open to hear that more feedback regarding that. But presently, I feel like the Chromebook is meeting the needs, um, and we have been able to address some of you know most of the issues that have been brought to our attention, if not all. Okay. Um, Does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I mean, certainly you can't use PowerPoint on a Chromebook, right? You have to use Google Slides instead, mm -hmm. and it's not the same. I mean, but we, so. we can put Microsoft Suites on the Chromebook as, a, as an application, so that's what I'm saying. Like, mm -hmm. some of those issues are able to be addressed. So I, I think that yeah. some of that can be addressed through, like, you know, professional development for teachers is to understand what the capabilities are of the Chromebook. But, you know, again, I would like to hear mm -hmm. what some of those issues are because... The Chromebook has allowed us to reduce our costs as it relates to providing technology. And also, as we look for, you know, the, we have to also think about the replacement. So we, uh, so as Jeff was talking about, you know, the auditorium and uh, the space at the high school, we have to also think when we're purchasing digital learning devices, we have to think about the long-term plan. Like, what is the cost of the replacement as technology advances every four or five years? Mm -hmm. So we also have to think about that when we go into, you know, selecting a digital learning device for, for students and for teachers and for staff. Can I just clarify? So mm -hmm. if the new technology plan is going to be ready next week, could we hear it at our meeting next week? Um, I don't think the plan will be ready. One of the things that we'll be waiting to see is what the allocation will be from the Capital Planning Committee. We have, uh, again, asked for the amounts we've had the past years. Next week is the week that they will be making their recommendations. So I think that it's important um, for us to know exactly what the, the, needs are. Fun the, the funding is going to be um, uh, for the technology uh, programming. But we'll be able to identify the needs, and we'll be able to match the needs with the funding. So, I mean, that will be the probably the piece that we have to finalize, and then we could present it to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe January? I'm just trying to think ahead to what agenda to slot it into. We could, well, we could, let's we could, let me, we could let's get talk in. to David and mm -hmm. get, get that. But I, I agree that it would be uh, important for you to mm -hmm. have that mm -hmm. discussion before you go on to the last stage of the budgeting, mm -hmm. yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. And and we could we we could we actually have a meeting tomorrow, so we could yeah. we can definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, looping mm -hmm. back, does anyone have any questions for Mr. Libby? Did I answer your question about the technology? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Jason. Thank you. Jason. Okay. So, and and thank you for the information too. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So moving on. Superintendent's report. Oh, God. I actually don't have um, a lot this evening, but following up on the whole issue of the auditorium, tomorrow evening is the winter concert for the high school. Mm -hmm. And again, the community is invited. If you've never come to a high school concert, I think you will be rather pleased that you, you attended. So that is tomorrow evening. I, I, I'm not going to go through all of these grants, but I just want you to be aware that we have received um, 
three different grants. The, the, the awards are in the range of seven to 10,000, but these are grants that um, will further the work we're doing, safe and supportive schools. And um, uh, what I'm gonna do is give more of a complete explanation in an upcoming newsletter, but we continue to be looking for additional funding beyond what we have um, uh, allocated through our operating budget. But I, you know, I, wanted to, I want to thank the, the people who work on these grants, which is a very collaborative effort, but certainly led by Julie Dunn for the work they're doing to do this. And we're working right now on a, we actually we've already submitted it, a very large grant for nursing, which we'll get back to you. Hopefully we will receive that grant. Um, but in keeping with um, the discussion about the schools, uh, there's nothing really much more to report about um, Hardy. I don't know when we're gonna get the TCO, uh, but it's probably going to be fairly soon. We know that we have furniture in the process right now of being delivered. And um, I think everything is going just as we had planned um, going forward. As respect to the high school, I, I think the discussion tonight gives you a good idea of the work that's currently going on with the high school plans. Uh, for people who are listening, the next uh, meeting of the building committee is this coming Tuesday evening here in the school committee room at six o'clock. And that's it. Oh, great, thank you. Okay. So moving on, we have the consent agenda. We're now running two minutes ahead of schedule. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant, warrant number 19103, dated 11-29-2018, total amount of warrant $649,163.92. Approval of minutes, regular school committee minutes of 11-29-2018. Approval of trips, US, U, AHS UPenn model Congress trip on March 28, 2019. And Audison, London, and Environs trip for, scheduled for April 2020. Please hold the warrant. The I warrant. can't vote on it. Okay. Um, anything else? Okay. So we're holding the warrant. Um, all those app who approved the consent agenda without the warrant. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? So, so that's unanimous. And. Um, can I have a motion to approve the warrant? So moved. A second. Okay. Um, is there, does anyone want to speak to or against it? No? Okay. I, all in f oh. I was just going to say I'm getting reimbursed for my conference. That's why I can't vote for it. Actually, not the one we're voting on, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. It's Any opposed? <laughs> Any abstentions? I think it. But just an anticipation you that you're highly ethical. You abstain. Yeah, yeah. It's fine. Set an example. Okay. Mm. Hold and confused. <laughs> okay. It's fine. Well, I'm right there with you. Okay, so. moving on. But you do have to Policy. do it again. Policy. <laughs> Manual update. We have updated A through L. Done. Mm -hmm. um, subcommittee and liaison reports. Budget. Uh, so um, we're having another meeting of budget and CIAA, I apologize to Paul for scheduling it during the school day. We forgot about you because you weren't there at the yeah, last Yeah, I was meeting. in Japan, so <laughs> you're, you're gonna mess with me uh, in another meeting, you know. Yeah. But, uh, uh, but this, is, this, is the, this is the current copy um, that we're gonna go over tomorrow, so we'll talk afterwards um, uh, to go over the items that are in the plan. Um, should we do a long range planning update now or? Uh, there was a long-range planning uh, meeting was it this week. Yes, yes, Monday. No, Tuesday. Monday. Tuesday, yes. Um, uh, as a result of some of my advocacy, we increased the revenue assumptions a little bit, six hundred thousand um, uh, dollars, because uh, our local receipts, primarily excise tax and building inspections, have been coming in much higher than what's in the plan. So that um, reduces the deficit, but it's still a large deficit, $5 million in 2022, and then it jumps to $17 million in 2023. Um, so their discussions are continuing about 
what to do and when, and we can talk more about it that tomorrow at our meeting, I think. Okay. Um, whoops. Community relations, anyone speak to it? Nope. We had our coffee. Oh, no, that's right. Right, only yes. one person. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Janet said last week she was going to advertise it, and she didn't, and then so I didn't. Um, if they're not advertised, they're just not well attended, so we have to think about that. Um, one person stopped by who happened to be there um, to met, give us some feedback on the building project, and that was it. Um, curriculum. No report. Facilities. I met with uh, <clears throat> some parents at uh, Pierce to discuss the playground. Uh, they had a question asked about private money being uh, used, and I uh, questioned the town council. He gave me uh, an answer, and I passed it back to them. Okay, great. Uh, policy. We've, anything we, else? We did it. We did it. Hey. We did it. Yeah. And nice I think, wasn't it Bill who started this whole thing? You're going to blame me? Okay. No, well, I'm not blaming you. Yeah. When was the committee No, no, no. I, didn't vote no, no I, think I, I, I think I that brought it to, to get him. Bill was the to one. Do it two years ago. Yeah, yeah. I Long think we process. owe Bill a thing. Yeah, Bill, <laughs> Bill was uh, a great person in, in this. I mean, Let's not get carried away. <laughs> Bill is um, scurrilous. That'll That's better. <laughs> That's much better. Okay. Legal services. Nothing at this time. Uh, building committee, anything else? No, nope. next meeting is on, as Kathy said, is on Tuesday, and then we have a forum on the 14th of yeah. January at 7 p.m. at Town Hall. Which will focus mostly on cost. Yes, and so we will be answered. There have been lots of questions raised about cost, and we'll have answers. Uh, Gibbs? Nothing. Any liaison reports, announcements, or future agenda items? Yes. Mr. Um, Hainer. Uh, the Bridging Two Communities, uh, the families from Arlington and uh, Boston met at the, uh, on December 1st uh, for an evening of socializing at the 12th Baptist Church. It was well attended, over 80 people came. It was really a wonderful time. Uh, Metco Directors Conference was on the 13th, um, I'm sorry, uh, on the 7th. Dr. Dina Simmons was the keynote speaker, her dynamic approach and sharing her thoughts and ideas of how schools should use the power of emotions to create more compassionate and just society. She met with superintendents and administrators. Uh, I wasn't able to attend because I'm not a superintendent. Uh, I attended the one on restorative practice and transformation of narrative for black and Latinos. It was fantastic. There was discussion and uh, some role playing. And last but all, uh, EDCO, we discussed blizzard bags and uh, snowy day replacement uh, as an alternative to school learning questions and answers and problems that have been encountered and how they've resolved them. Thank you. All right. Anything, Mr. Cardin? Uh, so the Arlington Education Foundation announced their um, fall grant cycle. <clears throat> it's in your Arlington, so it must be public. Um, uh, so there were $22,000 worth of grants that were awarded. Um, again, you can look at the article on your, your Arlington that describes uh, all the wonderful things that they're funding in the district. Anything else? No? Okay. So at this point, we're going to go into executive session. We will exit only to adjourn. Um, we will to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted and we'll be discussing Superintendent Bodie's contract. And can I have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. A second? Okay. Um, any discussion? All in favor, this is a roll call vote. Roll call. Mr. Hainer? Aye. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Aye. Aylman, yes. Aylman, yes. Garden, and me, I say yes also. And. Yes. 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 Yes.